first sight, they are respectable citizens. But in reality, people with dark impulses and savage killers. They live apparently normal lives. In the US, the Milwaukee monster puts his victims in the freezer and submerges them in acid. The manager says, hey, I thought, what stinks in your apartment? He said, well, my fish died. In Russia, investigators find 70 bodies in a river and don't know who is behind it. If you don't have the identities of the victims, there's no place to start. In Germany, a daughter discovers after her father's death he was a serial killer. You almost have to narrow your focuses and try not to torture yourself over the things that you'll probably never get answers to. How are psychopathic serial killers hunted down? Investigators are put to the ultimate test, for these are among the most ruthless criminals in the world. Russia, Bitsevsky Park on the south side of Moscow. 22 square kilometers in area, intended as a place for people to relax. They come here to play chess, to picnic, or simply to enjoy a walk. But a killer is on the loose. Bitsevsky Park is his place to commit crimes and his refuge. Earlier, he had always played chess there with his grandfather. It was a source of positive energy and where he started to kill people. It became a place where he was the master. A frightening development. Between 2005 and 2007, people regularly find dead bodies in Bitsevsky Park, around 40, all male. Almost all homeless, alcoholics, socially deprived. The police aren't doing the best of their job, at least in the beginning phases, before they realize it's a serial. You find that the crime scenes aren't really properly done because of who the victim is. These were people maybe that society didn't consider very worthwhile. In October of 2005, another murder is committed in Bitsevsky Park. The police finally have to react. A special homicide unit is formed. At the crime scene, Detective Andrei Supronenko finds hidden in the bushes a dead man, Nikolai Vorobiev, brutally murdered. No one who saw him will ever forget how he looked. Like a schnitzel beaten with a hammer. We imagine several possibilities. Someone must have been very angry, a psychotic man or a woman. We also discovered that the killer had been very careful. He left no evidence. He took everything with him that he touched at the crime scene. The autopsy reveals the man was most likely hit with a hammer. Supronenko searches for the weapon in the park to no avail. Hammers are rarely used in homicide cases. It's a very up close and personal weapon. In a way, it tells me he wants this to be over very rather quickly. So it's not about the killing. It is perhaps just literally about the number. The investigator's first destination, a psychiatric sanatorium near the park. Perhaps one of its patients is the killer they're searching for. We checked out the people being treated for psychiatric problems in this hospital. We looked at what kind of patients were here, what diagnoses, and what profiles they had. We checked if they could leave the hospital property, if they could disappear for a night or longer. We found no evidence of that, so we closed this avenue of the investigation. The investigation hits a dead end. No evidence at the crime scene. No motive. No weapon. 
Supronenko takes action and combs the entire park with 200 police officers. They question all passers-by. In the process, Supronenko discovers a suspicious person. He seems nervous, perhaps in part because police are there. While searching the area, we discovered a man wearing women's clothing. He ran from the police, which immediately made him suspicious. He was in the part of the woods where the killer had last struck. We even found a hammer in his bag. Naturally, we checked him out right away. But he had an alibi, so we had to let him go. The real killer continues to creep around the park and even feels provoked by the false arrest. He says, well, I'm going to show you that the guy you have in custody is not your guy. He was furious. He was outraged. He, these were his killings and he wanted the credit. And as a result, he redoubled his efforts. He killed more people and kept on killing to show the police that they were wrong. In April of 2006, he strikes again. Inspector Supranenko heads to the crime scene. The victim lies hidden in the bushes among the trees. This time it's a woman. Branches are stuck in her head. Insertion of objects into the body may well suggest to some a sexual component. It's typical that as a serial killer goes on that the crimes increase in severity. So there is maybe more sadism and so you do see an escalation of severity of crimes over time as we see in this case. But this time the detective makes a crucial discovery in the pocket of the victim's pants. When searching her clothes, we found a subway ticket. That showed us which subway station she had used and the precise time of her arrival. The subway ticket is the long-awaited clue. Will it actually lead to the perpetrator? The ticket tells investigators at which station the victim entered and exited the subway. Andrei Supranenko reviews the security camera videos from the day of the murder and gets lucky. The woman appears accompanied by a man. Is he her killer? The day after we found the body, her son contacted the police and reported his mother missing. At the same time, we were reviewing the security camera videos and saw Mrs. Moskalyova leave the station with a man. They went in the direction of Bitsevsky Park. The mother had left her son a message with a number and the name of the man with whom she intended to go for a walk. Pichushkin. But who is this man? Pichushkin was born on April the 9th, 1974. He grows up with his mother and sister on Hersonskaya Street, in a typical Soviet-era apartment block near Bitsevsky Park. His childhood is marked by poverty, his father rarely home. As a small child, Pichushkin has a bad fall with serious consequences. But he had uh, an accident in his childhood when he fell off a swing, and it's believed that that gave him some brain damage and to the front of his head, and these are the part of the brain that control emotions and aggression and behaviour. 80 to 90 percent of serial killers, and about the same rate of general murderers, had some sort of brain trauma. And so there's a huge correlation between brain trauma or, or brain damage to some extent and going on to later kill people in adulthood. Pichushkin's grandfather takes care of him and teaches him to play chess. 
His grandpa taught him chess. He was good at it. So Pichushkin nearly always won. Each victory helped him overcome his inner aggression. As long as his grandpa was alive and regularly played chess with him, his aggressive outbursts were almost neutralized. But then his grandfather dies, and Pichushkin's outbursts intensify. In June of 2006, investigators discover his address. They place his apartment under observation and ultimately arrest him. Inspector Supranenko interrogates him, but the suspect keeps silent at first. At night, we got a call that Petrushkin wanted to talk now and would confess to Moskalyova's murder. Once he admitted it, we knew that we had to get him to talk more. Initially, I acted skeptical in order to provoke him to convince me. As he told us more and more details, we understood his character. He wanted us to recognize his achievements, so we started to treat him with respect, as if he were a hero. We did that to keep him talking. They hadn't caught them in all these years with all these killings. And it's so good to boast to the police that you are better than them. Investigators make an incredible discovery when searching his apartment. During the search, we found a chessboard in his apartment. Almost all the squares had numbers stuck on them that he had cut out of the newspaper. After each murder, he stuck a number on the board, assigning each murder victim a square on the chessboard. He wanted to kill 64 victims, the number of squares on the chessboard. But what Supranenko still lacks, the murder weapon, the hammer. Investigators take the accused back to the scenes of his crimes. The idea is for him to show them how he killed his victims. Supronenko also hopes that he will tell them where the weapon is. At the crime scenes, Pichushkin comes out of his shell. He shows everything precisely. He gives the impression of reliving the crimes. Pichushkin could recall every small detail that interested him. The time, down to the minute, the date the murder took place. That was important to him. What didn't interest him were the clothes the victims wore. He couldn't remember that well. When we interrogated him in the office, he was dull and bored. But when we went to the crime scene to check the details, he was lively. He enjoyed it. This was his real life. The strategy of bringing Pichushkin back to the crime scene to talk works. He even leads investigators to the murder weapon's hiding place. Divers recover it from a small pond in Bitsevsky Park. It was important to find the murder weapon so that we could prove the killer had used it. When we found the hammer in this pond and examined it, we discovered that a small piece of it was missing. And one of the victims had precisely this piece lodged in his head. That made us 100% certain he was the killer. Investigators now have the killer, a confession, and the murder weapon. Pichushkin is indicted on September the 13th, 2007, for the murder of 48 people. Pichushkin keeps silent the first couple of days, but as he notices how much attention the trial generates, he begins to talk. Pichushkin shows no remorse. He testifies that he would have continued killing. He says, 20 of you are judging me, but during the murders, I was alone and decided myself who should live and who should die. I was like God, but I showed him that he was no God. My job was to put him in jail, and what he felt about it does not interest me. A person is only an object for him, on which he can demonstrate his greatness and power. I'm sure he was thinking, I'm very intelligent, although everyone completely underestimates me. The trial lasts six weeks. 
On October the 29th, 2007, the court sentences Pichushkin to life in prison. He's still serving time. People in Moscow can breathe easy again. But other killers are even more ruthless. Their crime scenes, a horrific sight. I don't think you'll, you can ever prepare yourself for that type of um, scene that you're coming across. Their crimes shock investigators, gruesome puzzles for them to solve. As in this case, the killer has sex with dead bodies. Jeffrey Dahmer, the Milwaukee monster, puts bits of dead bodies in his freezer. Jeffrey Dahmer is one of the most prolific and most renowned serial killers in the world. The worst case in the career of Detective Dennis Murphy. It's our job to remain cool. Your duties are to convict the guy and make sure he's found guilty. Dharma kills at least 19 people in a way never before seen. Milwaukee on the night of July the 22nd, 1991. A man discovers an acid drum with body parts in the apartment of his friend, Jeffrey Dahmer. What officers find in the apartment is sheer horror. A freezer full of body parts. Detective Dennis Murphy doesn't yet suspect that they're arresting one of the most ruthless killers in American history. At 3 o'clock, I get a call from Lieutenant Vaughan. He says, you got to get in here. we got a guy that's got 10 or 11 skulls in his apartment. And of course, I said, yeah, you're, you're pulling my leg. But I had other words for that. But I, I didn't believe him. And he said, I'll get back. And I hung up. Then he called me back. He said, I'm serious. Get in here. So then I went into work right away. While his colleagues collect evidence, back at the station, Murphy proceeds with hardened concentration. He must get Dharma to confess. I spoke with him for 17 hours the first day, over 17 hours. And then the next day, I believe it was 16. And by that time, we had the full confession from him before his attorney could come in and say, hey, I want to talk to him. And when he did, Dahmer didn't want to talk to him. He signed a release saying, I don't want to talk. After three days, Dennis Murphy breaks the killer. Dharma begins to confess, and what he says sounds unbelievable. It all begins in the Ambassador Hotel, the Milwaukee monster's first crime scene. Here, Jeffrey Dharma kills his first victim, a sexual partner, Stephen Tuomi. And then he had a problem to get rid of the body. So he went to the surplus store down on Wisconsin Avenue, picked up a used suitcase, brought it back, put Tomei in the suitcase. He was a strong individual, and he could lift it with no problem, so he'd handle it himself. Dharma has incredible luck. Neither employees nor guests notice anything. Detective Murphy can barely believe it. Not much unless there was a complaint or blood was dripping out of a suitcase and someone saw it, but there's no complaint in the rooms next to him if there were people in the rooms at that time. So if there's no complaint, there's nothing to stop him. Dharma takes a taxi from in front of the hotel and rides home with a body stowed in the trunk. On the side of Dharma, it must have given him a, a great sense of satisfaction that he was able to get away with this. At the time, Dharma is still living in a suburb of Milwaukee with his grandmother. He dismembers Tuomi's body and stows it in the basement. Detective Murphy can hardly comprehend what he's hearing. I spoke with the grandmother herself, and she said she had hearing problems, and she kind of had a suspicion that Jeff liked boys, but she wasn't sure. Jeffrey Dahmer is a homosexual. Two months after his first murder, he lures two more young men to his house and kills them. Then he has sex with their dead bodies. So drugging them or 
killing them first and then having sexual behaviors probably just made him feel more comfortable because he didn't really have that ability to interact with people. People can reject you, they can leave you, et, et cetera. I don't like them moving. I don't like them talking. I just want them laying there. Well, that's what you get with a dead body. Detective Murphy discovers that Dharma nonchalantly throws the body parts out with the household garbage. The Milwaukee monster leaves the garbage can at the curbside. He showed no outward features. Like many serial killers, they live apparently normal lives. They get on with their life. They are polite. So for the police, until they get a clue, until they get a lead, it's very difficult. Dharma's story begins in the small city of Bath, Ohio, population 10,000. As a young boy, he tortures animals. In Jeffrey Dharma's case, his early interest in injuring animals and to examining road kills is clearly a pointer to where he was going to get to in his life. This low empathy probably continued into adulthood and the target simply changed. Dharma kills his first victim when he's just 18 years old. He takes hitchhiker Stephen Hicks home with him and beats him to death. With the body in the trunk of his car, Dharma is stopped by police, but he talks his way out of it. And in fact, they were really close at the very beginning of his murderous career. Probably was a big confidence booster for him that he was able to manipulate the police and act calm under those circumstances. He begins his career as a murderer. In May of 1990, Dharma's grandmother kicks him out of the house. The Milwaukee monster moves out into the Oxford apartments. Now he can kill as he pleases. In the summer of 1990, four more murders. Dharma begins to eat pieces of his victims. You could say in sex in general, there's a desire to have a piece of someone else inside of you. I think you could say that there, it may have been a, a, an overflow of that, a manifestation of that desire to feel his lovers inside him uh, by eating them. More and more men die in Dharma's apartment. What Detective Dennis Murphy still does not understand why no one on the property reports the smell of the decomposing bodies? Well, they did smell something, but when they went to Dahmer's apartment, the manager says, hey, I said, what stinks in your apartment? He said, well, my fish died. Corpse is in his room for two or three days before he disposed of them and cut them up. He'd put them in acid and then flush it down the toilet and break the bones and throw them in the garbage when the garbage men came. The detective discovers the police actually could have arrested Dharma much sooner. On May the 27th, 1991, the police receive a call from a young man in Dharma's apartment. He's afraid of the killer and begs for help. The police believe it's just a fight between two gay men. Now one might say, but how, how could that have happened? But at the time in Milwaukee, the police had a lot of criticism for how they dealt with the gay community. And as a result of this, they were very hesitant to get involved in any sort of gay dispute between, possibly, potentially between two lovers. It's very frustrating, I think, for law enforcement to recognize, especially in Jeffrey Dahmer's case, that they were really, really close a couple of times. The police leave the young man in the apartment, a fatal mistake. After they departed, um, Dahmer murdered this 14-year-old boy. Detective Dennis Murphy finds out Dahmer often picks up his victims in nightclubs. In his apartment, he injects acid into the men's brains. Somebody that wouldn't interact with him or wouldn't talk, but would be alive and available for him to have sex with. I mean, that's that kind of magical thinking that you think that only a crazy person would think like that, or somebody who was psychotic. Thus ends an unbelievable confession. Detective Murphy squeezed everything out of Dharma during the interrogation. 
But in court, the Milwaukee Monsters defense attorney pleads insanity. We're on. Psychologists attest to Dahmer's various psychological disturbances, including schizophrenia. The ongoing trial is in danger. Well, it's our job to remain cool and calm, confident and comfortable, because if you show any distress, they're going to jump on you. If you get everything screwed up, you're going to lose your testimony. We had to prove sanity, and I think we did. In the end, the court rejects the plea and sentences Jeffrey Dahmer to life in prison. This has never been a case of trying to get free. I didn't ever want freedom. Frankly, I wanted death for myself. One year later, Dennis Murphy visits Dahmer in prison. And at that time, he had went from 190 pounds of muscle to 215 pounds of kind of flab. He didn't have the grip he had before. He told me he, was, he found God, he was good with it, and that he was gonna be dead in six months and he wanted to die. It takes longer. Two years after the verdict, another prisoner beats Dahmer to death in his cell. To this day, Dennis Murphy still has a strange feeling, somewhere between satisfaction and fear that there might be more people like Dahmer. I'd go home and I'd tell my wife about it, but I wouldn't go into all of how he, what he did. I just said he cut up the body parts and disposed of them. And my children even heard it. But I said, this is one in a million. I don't want you to think people are all like this. But there are more of them. Ruthless killers who know no sympathy for their victims. They kill for years, unnoticed. Their victims, men, women, and even children. Didn't care if they lived or died, didn't care if he hurt them. Also in Russia, shortly after the fall of the Soviet Union, chaos and poverty reign. Poverty that one man takes advantage of. Alexander Spesivtsev traps his victims with the help of his own mother. I don't think you'll, you can ever prepare yourself for that type of um, scene that you're coming across. For investigators, unbelievable. Such people shouldn't be allowed to live. How and after how many murders do they stop the man who is perhaps the most ruthless killer of all time? Russia, more precisely, deeper Siberia, Novokuznetsk, a city of half a million inhabitants. The anonymity of the big city helps one man to kill unnoticed. But not just anyone, he kills children. Investigators chase him for seven months. The head of the team, Alexander Oreshin. I had nothing to do with serial killers before. I had often been to crime scenes, but serial killers? Spazivtsev was my first. As a matter of fact, the first for the whole city. In June of 1996, people out for a walk find strange things in the Aba River. Oreshin is one of the first at the scene. His team searches the riverbank for five days. They find feet, hands, human bones. If you don't have the identities of the victims, there's no place to start with who are these w girls, when did they disappear, where were they taken from? All you've got is a body that has no identification. After finding the body parts, Oreshin is certain very, very many people have been killed in Novokuznetsk, all of them children. When we found the body parts, it was a horrible sight. The whole team immediately developed ideas for how we could catch the killer. 
Suspicions range from trade in organs to child prostitution to a psychopathic serial killer. The last conjecture is correct, but Inspector Oreshin still has no leads. And investigating is difficult in that period. At the beginning of the 1990s, Russia is in upheaval. Massive poverty reigns. If you look at Russia at this time, uh, the USSR is breaking down. Uh, there's a very poor economics. People are starving. Men got drunk or left their families. Mothers fought for every job and drank, too. Children were no use to anyone. This was the population the victims came from. No one was looking for them. One man takes advantage of precisely this. His name, Alexander Spesistsev. But Inspector Oreshin does not yet have any leads. Where and for whom should he even look? Naturally, we took as many children off the streets as possible and returned them to their parents. But starving children go back out on the street after a short time. And never come back home. In the next five months, over 70 children disappear, none older than 13. Police comb the area around Novokuznetsk. The whole city, every suspicious apartment. It seems unfathomable that an individual could be capable of abusing children in this way. And the question, of course, is where, where does it come from? How does a human being turn into a savage child killer? The killer grows up in a family plagued by domestic violence. His father rapes drinks and abandons a family when Spesistsev is 13. You see a very dominant father who's abusive to the family. He's abusive to the son, to the mother, probably emotionally abusive, sexually abusive, physically abusive. As Alexander grows up without a father, he takes on the role his father had once occupied. Spesistsev, the new head of the family, is always an outsider. Early on, he shows signs of psychological disturbances. He gets married, kills his wife during a fight, and is put in a mental institution. The methods of the Soviet psychiatric ward were based on beatings, fetters, and injections. After three years, Spesistsev is released as a psychological wreck. Four months after the bodies are discovered on the riverbank, three girls disappear from a bus stop. A woman lures them to her house. Everyone is under suspicion, but not Spesistsev. Everyone thinks he's still in the institution. In reality, Spezitsev had been out for a while, only we didn't know, despite having asked. That was a big bureaucratic mistake, a mistake that cost many innocent children's lives. As so often happens, a coincidence brings about the crucial shift and sets Inspector Oreshin on the right trail. After a pipe burst, Plumbers try to check the apartment where Spesistsev and his mother, Ludmilla, live. But no one lets them in. The workmen inform the police. Inspector Oreshin will never forget what he finds here. We came into the apartment, and what we saw was horrifying. There were children's clothes scattered everywhere. There were body parts in the bathtub. And Olga was lying in the living room, severely injured. I don't think you'll, you can ever prepare yourself for that type of um, scene that you're coming across. Horeshin steps onto a savage battlefield. Even as an expert, it's hard for me to understand how someone can be capable of committing this level of brutality over such a long period of time with such a vulnerable population. In the apartment, a severely injured and traumatized girl. 
How should you feel when you see dead children and an injured 13-year-old girl whose eyes register only pure dread? But there is no trace of Spasistsev. He escapes from the roof. The same day, the girl provides the missing information. Who brought you to the apartment? A granny. How did she do it? Did she ask you for help? She couldn't open the door? No. That's why she took you upstairs? Yeah. It turns out the killer's mother lures the victims into the trap, the home she shares with her son. She was basically his, his, his lackey to do whatever he wanted. The same day, Inspector Oreshin arrests the mother, Ludmila Spasivtsev. In addition, the police find photos of children and countless articles of children's clothing. Oreshin is certain the child killer of Novokuznetsk lives here. The mother, Ludmila, finally confesses and admits to having trapped the children. Oreshin keeps the apartment under observation and hopes that the son will come back. For guys like this, this is the only life they have ever known. This is where he lives. Where is he going to go? And in fact, the killer does come home, and he's arrested. During the interrogation, mother and son quarrel. What kind of son are you? For months, I dispose of your bodies. Just yesterday, it was again four trash cans. And now you say it's my fault, because they want to know where the bodies are. Say where they are. How are you not ashamed? Why are you so mad at me? Such an ingrate. I'm not angry. The mother probably was not necessarily a willing accomplice. If she was on her own, she probably would not have got up to this type of behavior. The true nature of the strange relationship between mother and son is never clear. The court sentences Ludmilla to 13 years in prison. Her son, Alexander, is judged insane. Since then, he has lived in a psychiatric ward. Inspector Oreshin believes the killer has more than 80 children on his conscience. To be honest, I feel only disgust now. Everything having to do with Spasivtsev. It cost us so much energy to solve this case. But there is no justification for such people being allowed to live among us. Inspector Alexander Orashin will never forget the so-called Siberian tiger. He hopes the killer will never be released from the psychiatric ward. To this day, he's under lock and key. Others, however, are found only after they die. Germany, Frankfurt. For 30 years, the killing zone of Manfred Zeil, known as a German Jack the Ripper. The shocking thing, he not only kills his victims, he dismembers them. He didn't care if they lived or died. He didn't care if he hurt them. No one suspects anything about Manfred Zeil's dark side. He's considered a friendly family man. But in reality, he keeps body parts as trophies. Perfectly dismembering a body is the high point of sadism. But how can a dead serial killer be brought to justice? Schwalbach am Taunus, a small city near the metropolis Frankfurt am Main. On September the 10th, 2014, a young woman is cleaning out the garage of a recently deceased father. Manfred Zeil, beloved by all, a seemingly kind-hearted man and husband. But behind this garage door lurks a dark secret. You have, you know, the two sides of Seal that were so well concealed to everybody around him that they're not even discovered until after his death. When Zale's daughter opens two plastic barrels, she can't believe her eyes. They contain body parts. 
It's the remains of a prostitute named Britta Diallo. Is Manfred Seel a woman killer? Did he mutilate the victim so savagely? Forensic psychiatrist Manuela Dudek also wonders about one question in particular. Was it him? And if yes, why? There were many individual body parts. Many body parts make it possible to create a new person. The second idea is related to cannibalism. The muscles can be removed and the meat actually eaten. A dismembered body, highly unusual, and normally not an isolated instance. Police form the so-called Alaska unit and investigate the deceased Zeal. A search of his house turns up over 30,000 pieces of violent pornography. Pornography, while not inherently bad, can provide inspiration, if you will, for later sexual crimes. That he was essentially acting out some of the scenarios that he had in this uh, uh, pornographic films or pornographic photographs of these victims. He's essentially reproducing the same dynamic in his murders. An image in Sale's pornography collection resembles the wounds of the dead bodies in the barrel. Is there another side to Zeal? A dark side that no one knows? People who exhibit sexual sadism often have fractured pasts. Their childhood was not necessarily the kind one imagines as proper. It was marked by neglect and very possibly by physical assault as well. But in Manfred Seel's past, everything is entirely normal. He graduates high school, gets married, plays in a jazz band. His job? He runs a household clearance business. On the surface, always the friendly neighbor. This is a very frustrating case because you don't have an offender that can give you answers, can give you pointers, etc. So there's a lot of speculation as to the whys. Uh, why did this happen? Why did he do certain things? Were there more victims? Detectives focus their investigation on the Frankfurt streetwalking scene in the city's Bahnhofsviertel. Fazil's victim is a prostitute. Officers question numerous people in the red light district and learn that Zeel was a regular customer. Every Saturday, he looked for women engaging in sadomasochism. So we're making the linkage in cases. We're saying, okay, these cases are in, these cases are out, but now who's the offender? So we move from victims to linkage to offender. Here, we've got offender and no victim. So now we're trying to work back, like where, where do these pe people come from? So you have to look more at the behavioral, the victimology, how the person was murdered, where they were found, etc., and do what we call a behavioral linkage to see which cases can be included. The Alaska unit reopens all missing persons and unsolved homicide cases in the Frankfurt area. They investigate whether there are similarities with the victim Britta Diallo, and they hope to find further evidence regarding Manfred Zeel. Well, like a lot of serial killers, Seal is selecting victims that are basically available and vulnerable. Police look specifically at mutilated victims. The severed body parts in Manfred Zeel's barrel suggest that he liked to keep souvenirs. Psychologists call this trophy lust. Could Zeel have hidden it from his family? Psychopaths live out their perversions with prostitutes rather than at home because they learn early on to wall off their aggressions and then let them out in a controlled way. They leave their families unharmed because their social sense works well. After two years and over 230 pieces of information from the city's inhabitants, the Alaska unit is certain. Manfred Zeel is the killer, and he was responsible for even more deaths. 
Here, in the bushes of Highway A661, is where he probably killed a prostitute named Dominique Monrose in December of 1993. To this day, her head is still missing. Gisela Singh, Hatisa Arul Keroglu, and Gudrun Abel, all were probably also left mutilated by Manfred Zeel. He always keeps her body part with him. A trophy is a fantastic stimulus. It reminds you. It can give you a smell, a sight, a taste, and it can bring back to you all of those fantasies and realities, and you can relive the crime. The climax, a child murder in 1998. It shocks the entire country. Even if it's still not entirely certain, investigators believe that Zeal was behind it too. The killer cuts the boy's throat and cuts off his testicles and a piece of his thigh. The injuries also fit the 13-year-old boy. We saw that he was strangled, that he was mutilated, and that there were also injuries to the genital area. Whether Tristan indeed died at Manfred Zeil's hand has not been proven. But lots of evidence support the theory. The investigation is still open, for the detectives a burden. You almost have to narrow your focuses and try not to torture yourself over the things that you'll probably never get answers to, because unless he left a detailed diary of what he's done, we're not going to have insight into his mind. It's uncertain how many people Zeil really killed. The dead man lies silent in his grave. His wife is no longer alive. Other inquiries peter out. People like Manfred Zeil are able to live as social beings and hide their dark side. And they only take action when a victim comes along. Nevertheless, even after Manfred Zeil's death, the Alaska unit is able to prove he committed five murders. They're still investigating five other murders. To this day, no one knows why he did it. The killer has taken his dark secret to his grave. Manuela Dudek and the Alaska unit still believe Sale committed many more murders. But no matter what, he is going down in history as the Hessen Ripper, as one of the worst criminals in Germany, and he takes his place among people who managed to kill unnoticed. They hide the evil behind a facade. But in the end, investigators find them all, whether before or after their death, the most ruthless killers of all time. Innocent victims in the hands of ruthless criminals. Hostage takings, they are among the most difficult police situations and they often end fatally. The hostage takers threaten to kill one hostage every hour. Uganda, 1976, an airplane hijacking turns into a race against time. You feel like uh, you want to cover your head with a blanket? and call mommy or my god. Gladbeck, 1988. After three days, the hostage taker's odyssey ends in tragedy. Having it end that way is a punch in the gut. Moscow, 2002. 800 theater goers in the hands of Chechen terrorists. When the armed men appeared, people first thought it was part of the play. Hostage-taking, it's one of the worst crimes in the world. Beslan, in the North Caucasus. Here, like everywhere across Russia, September the 1st, 2004, is the first day of school. The principal welcomes the first graders and their parents. 
Russian families celebrate the first day of the first school year as a holiday. Then, around 9.30 a.m., an armed terror squad storms a school building. Taking of hostages is, is about leverage. If you have a demand, your, your hostages become the way that you get your demand, but also as a secondary function of hopefully protecting you while you are trying to get your demands fulfilled. The terrorists are from Chechnya, a region that has been fighting for its independence for years. The hostage takers demand the release of all Chechen prisoners, the withdrawal of Russian troops and President Putin's resignation. The Russians have almost always gone for a tactical solution to the problem. It might have been that hoping that because it's children, it's going to keep the Russians, delay the Russians from going to a tactical option because of the loss of life of children specifically. In light of the smoldering conflict, a team of the Russian Special Forces Alpha Group is stationed in the region around Beslan. They are elite soldiers named Spetsnaz. Immediately after receiving the distress call, Lieutenant Colonel Viktor Stipielevich sets off for the school. I thought, this is terrible for these children. I was concerned that the children come to no harm, that they must be freed. You go to the scene knowing that the situation can't be resolved in one day. Agent Stipielevich also knows that President Putin will not submit to extortion and that he himself must find a solution here on site. I don't believe the terrorists believe their demands would be met, despite their intimidation tactics. No political power would say yes to terrorists in such a global political context. When Stipielevich arrives at the school with his Alpha unit, the hopelessness of the situation becomes clear. 1,200 children, teachers and family members, surrounded by bombs and booby traps. The local police are completely overwhelmed by the situation. The first problem that Stipielevich must deal with, family members are still gathered in front of the school. The biggest challenge was that the locals had weapons and were boiling with rage. Most had children or grandchildren inside. They wanted revenge to kill the terrorists. In any hostage scenario, you want to control everything that, as far as possible that's taking place. The last thing you want is family members approaching the venue, because that can definitely trigger off an event that you have no control over. The situation is extremely tense. Agent Chipielevich must quickly get an overview of where exactly the terrorists have holed up on the school grounds. So he has his sharpshooters take up positions in the adjacent buildings. The sharpshooter's main job is to study the enemy, collect information and report where the terrorists and the hostages are. They also make sure the area is secure, no provocation takes place and no more terrorists come out of the school. His sniper teams identify 32 terrorists, including so-called black widows with explosive belts. Women do it because they are dependent on men in their patriarchy. Losing their husband means losing their life's one goal. The 1,200 hostages are now in the power of the Czechan terrorists for more than 24 hours. No end is in sight. After negotiating with the mayor on the second day, the terrorists let mothers with babies free. This deal plays into the agent's hand. Negotiations buy time, and the terrorists get tired. 
no matter how often they change positions. Their fatigue increases our chances of concluding the operation successfully. The point is to avoid any innocent victims and, above all, having to storm the building. An assault can only be the last resort. While agents Chipilovich plays for time, the situation inside the school escalates. One of the Black Widows blows herself up, killing several prisoners. They are all prepared to die. A lot of hostage takings, the people want to live thereafter. So that's also a good negotiation piece for the police, knowing that these individuals on the inside want to survive this. But in this scenario, we know that these, these types of offenders are all prepared to die. And that really changes the dynamics of how you should be dealing with these type of scenarios. The terrorists bring 16 hostages to the upper floor and execute them. Then they throw the bodies thoughtlessly out of the window. The hostage takers treated the children incredibly poorly. They watched as children died of starvation and thirst. This showed the lack of empathy in the situation and the lack of regret. Shortly thereafter, explosions can be heard. The roof of the gymnasium collapses, killing countless people. Even the experienced soldier, Stipielovich, is shocked by the scene. This is a new experience. I'd never dealt with children before. Throughout my service, I have never seen a dead child. And then so many at once. This is what hell must be like. Panic ensues. Hostages flee from the gymnasium. Parents attempt to free their children. The terrorists open fire. Around 2.30 p.m., Stipielovich receives the order to storm the school and free the hostages. The Russians opted for a tactical solution to the problem, which means going into the venue to try and kill the terrorists and free the hostages. And under the best of circumstances, that is always a very risky option. Through an adjacent garden, Stipielovich's group makes its way to the rear building and uses a blind spot to enter the cafeteria unseen through a window. You're full of adrenaline at the start. You must do everything so fast. Shoot, save hostages, protect comrades. So you forget everything. There comes a point when you forget that you could die here and now. The Alpha unit risks its life to save the children from the hostage takers. The majority of the terrorists have holed up in the cafeteria, the firefight lasts several hours. Ten thousand bullets are fired. Stipelovich and his team save hostage upon hostage from the hail of bullets. But their success comes at a price. Not only innocents die, so do three of his comrades. You can't consider yourself lucky to have witnessed Bezlan that I stayed alive. You always hope to stay alive during an operation. That's a natural human reaction, even for an elite soldier. Stupinovich and his unit killed 27 of the 32 suspected terrorists. The majority of the hostages are freed, but the situation is not yet under control. Some terrorists are still holed up in a basement room and shooting at everything that moves, thus impeding the rescue of the remaining children. In this situation, the agent opts for a drastic solution. There were four terrorists left, and we could not reach them with our weapons. 
We decided to get a tank with a sharpshooter inside. The tank shot three times from different directions. Of course, tank fire leaves no chance of survival. The operation was over shortly before midnight. At first, the Alpha unit believes that they've killed all the terrorists. But one hostage taker, Nurpashi Kulayev, tries to escape and is taken alive. After three days, the hostage crisis ends with a woeful result. 331 children and adults have died. There are situations that have only a bad outcome or an even worse one. No doubt, some people died because the operation was poorly led, but it is highly unlikely that the government will ever admit it. To this day, Bezlan and its inhabitants remain traumatized by the hostage crisis. Nor will Stipielovich ever forget the mission. The government takes care of the victims, but it does the bare minimum. To use a metaphor, if Russia awards you the hero medal, you get a monthly government check. If not, you get almost nothing. In April 2016, the European Court of Human Rights ruled against Russia for the hostage drama's bloody ending. The government is supposed to pay fair compensation to the surviving relatives. Hostage takings almost always end fatally. The hostage takers threaten to kill one hostage every hour. The victims at the wrong place at the wrong time. When I heard about the hijacking, my first thought was about the hostages. It could have been me, it could have been my family. Gladbeck, 1988, a bank robbery escalates. The robbers' escape becomes a media circus, 72 hours long. The perpetrators even give interviews. I will hit the first one who gets in my way. After three days, the public pressure escalates and the police have to act. In the end, two hostages and one police officer die. Having it end that way is a punch in the gut. Could quicker intervention have prevented the death of three innocent people? Gladbeck, North Rhine-Westphalia. August the 16th, 1988 will change Germany. One of the most spectacular hostage dramas in Germany's history begins in this bank. Suddenly they find themselves in a situation where they have to take hostages just to merely get away. And that can be quite a, a, a difficult situation to manage. Michael Hering at that moment is a SWAT team leader in Bremen. He knows how a hostage situation must be dealt with. The hostages' lives are the first priority, of course, then bystanders, police injuries. All that should be ruled out. At this point, Herring does not yet know that all this cannot be avoided in this hostage crisis. Officials accede to the demands of the two bank robbers, Dieter Degoski and Hans-Jürgen Rösner, and give them a car. That lets them escape from the bank. They take two hostages with them. So you lose control if it becomes a dynamic rolling situation. They can go anywhere, they can get more hostages. So you really have no control over what happens once they leave the premises. In the middle of the night, the hostage takers flee in the direction of Bremen. There they pick up Rosner's girlfriend, Marion Löblich. The police are close behind, they've bugged the car. This is how the police also discover that the criminals plan to free the hostages the next day. If I'm told that someone is traveling north, then I have time to prepare, to do something. There was no rushing around, no need for spontaneous action. 
until they got to Bremen. In Bremen war. However, investigators experienced their first setback during the night. The criminals stop at a gas station. They realize that their car is bugged. Therefore, they steal another car. The police lose control of the hostage takers. There'll always be certain things you can't necessarily control, but the, the broader scenario you want to be the one in charge of. And in this scenario, there was absolutely no control from the police's side. The next morning, the police have lost the criminal's trail. Degowski and Rosner still have two hostages in their power. And they're in downtown Bremen, their whereabouts unknown. Until Michael Hering is called to a bus stop in the city. There, the criminals hijack a bus and take 30 more innocent people hostage. So it, it is definitely an action of you've got more cards to play. Uh, it's higher risk for the police if they want to try something of a tactical nature. I will get on the bus and discuss everything with my buddy and girlfriend. And then I will hit the first one who gets in my way. The media were all over this. They were interviewing the suspects as this was live and happening. And it probably had a massive morbid fascination for, for, for people in Germany and probably outside of the country as this was happening in real time. Michael Herring and his team are fewer than 10 meters away and must stand by powerless as journalists mob the bus. 13 million viewers follow the events at the bus station on television. Hostage-taking, a live event. The press was already here when the bus was hijacked. This whole area was nowhere near cordoned off. It could not be cleared. They did what they wanted around the bus. And we couldn't get close enough to remove these people. Journalists get involved in negotiating with the criminals. What makes this case special is that the media went from observing the scene to actually becoming active agents within it. This time the police do not agree and the negotiations fail. Their tactic, play for time. Hours go by, but Rusner doesn't give up. Instead, he reacts more aggressively. Hostage takers continue their flight without a plan. Michael Hering and his team follow them to the Grundbergsee rest area. There, the criminals unexpectedly release the two bank employees from Gladbeck. And then officials make another serious mistake. They arrest Rosner's girlfriend on her way to the bathroom. We were told over the radio that Miss Lublik could be arrested. Who gave the order is still unclear. This decision enraged the criminals. So I think that probably put pressure that we have to now do something. Um, and that could have perhaps influenced them to take a decision that wasn't the best planned decision, or perhaps in that point of the, of the process, wasn't necessarily appropriate to where they were in the, in the process of the negotiations. Rosner goes crazy. He gives the police an ultimatum. Either his girlfriend is back in five minutes or the first hostage dies. Seconds before Marion Löblich comes back, Dieter Degowski kills 15-year-old Emanuele De Giorgi. The worst part for me was when we got the boy on the ground. That was the worst. Herring brings the boy inside the rest area, but he can no longer be helped. August the 18th, 1988, the third day of the hostage crisis. Their odyssey continues. The two criminals are still traveling with the bus. The police stop the bus near Aldensaal. The criminals finally negotiate. Success. The hostages are let free, all except Silke Bischoff and Ines Feutle. 
Provided with a new car, they move on to Cologne. Again, journalists harass the criminal duo. Although Rosner, pistol in his hand, is unpredictable. We know that violence often breeds violence. And in this case, Rosner had a violent father, which may have influenced his own propensity for violence. Civil policemen mingle with the crowd, but Rosner detects them and drives on, followed by police and journalists. Showdown on the A3. After three days, the public pressure escalates and the police have to act. The SWAT team decides to take action. An armored vehicle rams the getaway car. Silke Bischoff dies in the rescue operation. A catastrophe for Michael Herring and his team. To this day, a memorial commemorates the tragedy. In the back of your mind, you wish for a happy ending, a positive finish. Having it end this way is a punch in the gut. On March the 22nd, 1991, both hostage takers are sentenced to life imprisonment. Hostage situations are always a race against time. The hostage takers were unscrupulous and willing to kill to achieve their goals. Special forces units do everything to save the lives of hostages. They're prepared to sacrifice their lives if necessary. That's their job. Flight 139 from Tel Aviv. Hijacked by cold-blooded terrorists. They order the captain to fly to a new destination, Uganda, Central Africa. It's one of the most dangerous rescue missions of all time. Every single piece of the plan is risky. This is definitely, without a doubt, uh, regarded as one of the great success stories of, of any hostage release. Yiftah Hatia. He holds the fate of 270 hostages in his hands. And I knew that within one or two minutes, I am going to kill or I'm going to be killed. It's June the 27th, 1976. The Air France flight from Tel Aviv to Paris takes off on time. There are many Jewish passengers on board. After a stopover in Greece, four hijackers take over the plane. Wilfried Böse and Brigitte Kuhlmann, two German RAF terrorists and two terrorists of the Popular Front for the Liberation. The kidnappers were um Palestinian uh, kidnappers and also uh, kidnappers from Germany. So it was a collaboration between two different terrorist organizations that had a, a common theme in their dislike for Israel. The terrorists give the pilot a new destination, Uganda in Central Africa. 11 hours later, the hijacked plane lands at Entebbe airport. Four further Palestinian terrorists are waiting for it there. Together, they confine the hostages to the terminal. Then they inform the Ugandan president, Idi Amin. He is said to have killed over 300,000 people in his rise to power. He's considered one of the worst dictators in the world. And he is an enemy of Israel. Idi Amin is one of the most notorious dictators in the world. He is vengeful, he's impulsive, he's power hungry, and this is what makes him so dangerous. Which is really not the kind of regime that um, you, could, you could appeal to the common sense for support in, in dealing with this issue. Without diplomatic talks with Israel, Idi Amin decides to support the terrorists with his army. In Kampala, Uganda's capital, no one yet knows what is going on at the airport. He is one of the first to learn of the hostage crisis, a commander of the Israeli Special Forces Unit Sayaret Matkal. Yiftah Hatir is trained for dangerous missions. When I heard about the hijacking, my first thought was about the hostages. It could have been me, it could have been my family. Two days long, no one knows what's going on in the airport terminal. 
what the hostage takers want. Absolute silence reigns. Returning to the scene of the crime 40 years later brings the past back to life for the 66-year-old. I remember when we were coming, it was in the middle of the night, but they knew nothing of what is going to happen. And it seems to me like the same again, you know, we are driving in this car and uh, we look outside. They don't see us, we see them. It's kind of an operation. An operation in an environment totally unfamiliar to Israeli forces. The elite soldier, Atiyah, lacks essential information. Where exactly have the terrorists holed up? How are the hostages faring? They received no information from the Ugandan authorities. How heavily armed are the terrorists? On the third day, Idi Amin visits the hostages and announces the terrorists' demands. Five million US dollars. 53 terrorists are to be set free within 48 hours. Otherwise, the hostages die. Idi Amin is particularly famous for his rational behavior. The hostages don't matter to him. It's about showing off his power. So he didn't really have any particular support for the beliefs of these two terrorist organizations that actually kidnapped the plane. The Israelis have two days to free their countrymen. We started collecting the information about the airport, about the terminal, about the situation in the, with the hostages themselves. And then we found out that they separated between the Jews and the non-Jews, which is a very uh, emotional thing for Israelis. Everyone remembered the Holocaust, the selection. The mere thought of a second Holocaust leads to an outcry in Israel. Hostage negotiations are aimed usually at peaceful solution of the problem and release of the hostages without loss of life. But we do know that you always have to have your tactical option at the back of your mind. Israel pretends to give in to the negotiations, but what they're really doing is trying to distract the hostage takers. One day before the deadline, Israel makes a decision. It apparently accedes to the hijackers' demands. The terrorists free over 100 non-Israelis. They are picked up on the fourth day. By releasing hostages, you, you demonstrate goodwill. And also, if you're very focused, your, your whole point is Israel. You don't want to start to offend other countries. Yiftah Hatir capitalizes on the release of the mostly French hostages for his operation. We sent a small mission to France, among them an expert, someone from our unit, who knew what questions to ask, such as where the handle of the door is, either on the left side or on the right side. Where are all the hijackers all the time? Is any bomb planted? Israel receives another 48 hours to meet the demands. But in reality, it uses the time to implement a secret plan. A plan known only to Israel's elite unit, Yiftah Atiyah and his team. Their idea is to distract the terrorists. The soldiers wear Ugandan uniforms and arrive in the same Mercedes as President Idi Amin. To successfully do this operation would also show that they have the capability, the small country that they are, of striking wherever far away from their base. And that really would tell a lot of other hostage takers you're going to have to go very far to be very safe from us. The elite soldiers fly over three hostile nations. To stay under the radar, they fly the entire 4,000 kilometers at only 30 meters above sea level. After more than six hours, Entebbe Airport appears. Three planes stay behind, hovering over Lake Victoria. Only Hercules number one prepares to land, with Yiftach Atiyah on board. When the plane landed, yeah, it was frightening. After the airplane stopped and took the door down and the engine stopped, 
It was a silence, a very noisy silence. It, it was frightening, you know. You, you feel like uh, you want to cover your head with a blanket and call mommy or my God. But that was only for a split of a second. It's two minutes past 12 on July the 4th, 1976. Hercules One manages to land unnoticed on the furthest runway. Yiftah Hatir is the commander of the assault team. His mission? Storm the terminal, shoot the terrorists and free the hostages. There were three cars. I was in the second car. We looked around to see if we can recognize any, any enemy and we looked forward to see the control tower. And I knew that within one or two minutes I am going to kill or I'm going to be killed. I was ready. Just in front of the terminal, the column encounters two Ugandan soldiers. They see through the Israeli plan and shoot. The Israelis hit them first, but the element of surprise is lost. The commander said, go, 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 go. So I ran into the hall. I saw a Ugandan soldier. I shot him. I ran up the stairs. I saw another two Ugandan soldiers. I killed them too. And then I searched the roof, and in less than one minute, it was all over. Meanwhile, the other three planes have landed and take the freed hostages on board. After 53 minutes, the rescue operation is over. 99 freed Israeli citizens leave Uganda, making their way back home. The miracle of Entebbe becomes world famous. Even today, the operation performed by Yiftah Khatir and his team is considered the most spectacular rescue mission of all time. It really was a display of Israel's dominance for such a tiny nation to have such a massive success against two political, two terrorist organizations and a foreign country. Four hostages die in the firefight during the rescue operation. The top commander also pays with his life. I had mixed feelings because uh, our commander was killed, Yoni Netanyahu, and I felt very sorry for that. On the other hand, I was very satisfied because I took part in the most well-known operation ever. Operation Thunderbolt. Today, it's still considered the most successful rescue operation around the world. Moscow, the capital of Russia. On October the 23rd, 2002, Chechen terrorists transform an evening at the theater into pure hell. The terrorists take more than 800 theatergoers hostage and attempt to extort the Russian government. When the armed men appeared, people first thought it was part of the play. For Vitaly Dimitkin, a colonel in the Russian Special Forces Unit Alpha Group, it was his worst mission. We knew the situation was dire when we discovered the terrorists were Chechen. The Russian government opts for a military solution. The hostage crisis ends in tragedy. Moscow, the evening of October the 23rd, 2002. Around 9 p.m., during the second act of a musical in Dubrovka Theatre, a bus with heavily armed men and women drives up to the building. The musical Nord Ost was always a big success, playing to packed houses. A large number of people was guaranteed. A large room with few entrances and exits. The terrorists were guaranteed a large number of victims and they had the opportunity to launch a successful operation with minimal force. All of Moscow is on red alert. In addition to the police and emergency personnel, the Special Forces Unit Alpha heads immediately to the scene. Alpha is the Spetsnaz elite. This is a select, educated and trained group that is very fit and not merely physically. Whoever joins is prepared from day one not to come back from a mission. They're prepared to sacrifice their lives if necessary. That's their job.
Colonel Vitaly Dmitkin prepares himself mentally for an extremely dangerous mission. Of course I was nervous on the way. I thought of my family, my children, my parents. You're going into an unpredictable situation. I was scared. Dimitkin is an experienced elite soldier who has often risked his own life in order to free hostages. The situation at the theater is chaotic. 90 people managed to flee the building. The doors have now been locked. More and more elite units gather in front of the theater. When Vitaly Dimitkin arrives at the building, the first hostage is already dead. We heard over the radio that there were hostages and that the terrorists had serious weapons and bombs. There was a woman who ran into the building and was shot by a terrorist. At this point, Dimitkin does not yet know who exactly the terrorists are or what they want. The special forces set up their command central in the hospital across the street from the theater. The operations leader makes contact with the terrorists using walkie-talkies and mobile phones. We knew the situation was dire when we discovered the terrorists were Chechen. They have thorough training and never give up. Also, they have black widows with them, ready to blow themselves up. The Chechen terrorists have traveled about 2,000 kilometers to fight for their independence in Moscow. For Russia, this hostage crisis was unique for its length, misery and aftermath. The conflict between Russia and Chechnya began back in 1991 with the fall of the Soviet Union. Russia did not accept Chechnya's independence. War broke out in 1994 and 1999. With their assault on the Moscow theater, the hostage takers demand the fresh withdrawal of all Russian troops. The terrorists allow the visitors to call their relatives. I can't imagine what the family members felt when they got those panicky calls. It was surely a dreadful experience that no one should go through. To increase the pressure, the terrorists also have black widows with them. The women with the suicide belts have lost their husbands in the struggle against Russia and are therefore prepared to do anything. The black widows are prepared to sacrifice their lives. They've often lost their husbands or children in the war, and they're looking for revenge. Mediators try to enter into negotiation with the terrorists. The situation is extremely tense. Dimitkin and the Alpha unit place their sharpshooters in the adjacent buildings. Sharpshooters monitor the entire area and make sure that no terrorists come out or get help from outside that they get no signals from outside, that there is no one in the nearby buildings telling them how many of us there are or what we're doing. During the night, Dimitkin still does not know how many hostage takers there are. The next morning, the terrorists allow two doctors to take the body of the woman who had been shot, Olga Romanova, out of the building. The hostage takers were unscrupulous and willing to kill to achieve their goals. Vitaly Dimitkin and the Alpha team need every detail from the theater, and they immediately question the doctors. The information wasn't too precise. Rough number of terrorists, type of weapons, what's on the stage, and that there were women with suicide belts. We knew this information wasn't enough, as the doctors could only observe from one position. Which room the terrorists had and which not, we would have liked to know that. 
In order to get more information from the inside, the Alpha team looks for a way to enter the theater unnoticed. On the rear side of the building, they discover a ladder by which the soldiers can get onto the theater's roof. As we were looking around the roof, a TV crew appeared on the roof of the building across the street, transmitting live footage of us. All of Russia could see the Alpha team. Of course, the terrorists also saw it. They gave us an ultimatum, leave the roof immediately or we shoot every tenth hostage. The Alpha team leaves the roof. On the third day of the hostage crisis, negotiations come to a halt. The hostage takers threaten to kill one hostage every hour. This increases the pressure on the officials and they're required to act quickly. Mofsar Barayev, the leader of the terrorists, has the Russian government informed that there is no going back, that they have nothing to lose, and that they are prepared to die. The pressure on the government and the special forces unit mounts. A peaceful solution seems increasingly unlikely. You have to now make a decision. If you believe that the threat is valid, um, you have to decide how many potential hostages are we willing to risk before we can take action. Um, but at the same time, if you're not prepared and ready for it to take action, you could have more damage by engaging in a tactical option too soon. Vitaly Dimitkin and his Alpha unit react immediately. They make their way to another theater in Moscow and practice the assault there. We chose this building because it is structurally identical to the other theater. We trained with the special units there in case we had to storm the occupied theater. Some of the people who work with us are scared and emotional. To make the whole operation more predictable, we trained for the operation in identical spaces. The soldiers of the special forces unit know that an assault will take place. Back at Dubrovka Theater, they gain access to the building through a club on its rear side. Dimitkin wants to get as close as possible to the stage, as that is where the terrorists are holding the hostages prisoner. This time, the terrorists must not notice anything. Lights are strictly forbidden. The person running ahead becomes a bundle of nerves reacting to every noise, every movement, every draft of air. Normally, you go from the outside in. First, you stay close to the wall, in a circle. You secure one room at a time, moving toward the center. While the Alpha Team soldiers are in the building, there is a serious incident outside. The terrorists fire a grenade from the building, seriously injuring two Alpha Group members. The Special Forces unit returns fire immediately. Colonel Viktor Dimitkin is informed about a new government tactic. It leaks information that an assault on the theater is planned for the next morning. In reality, the domestic spy agency, FSP, pumps an unidentified gas into the theater, drugging the terrorists and hostages. It was already the third day. The people inside had no water and could not move. A decision had to be made. Each second could mean an even bigger tragedy. The terrorists, armed with bombs, have slowly lost their heads. The decision to use gas was made in order to keep the whole theater from being blown up and turning into a giant cemetery. When elite soldiers storm the building in the early morning, they are met with a horrifying scene. In itself, the idea of using gas to disable everyone and enter the occupied building without bloodshed is good. But in this case, it was like trying to shoot a fly on a person's forehead. The danger to those they wanted to rescue was much greater than the result they had hoped to affect. An overdose of the gas has caused hostages and terrorists to suffocate. 
The doctors didn't know what to do, as they didn't know what the gas was or how it worked. On the morning of October the 26th, the hostage crisis is over. And this is the deadly result. 129 hostages have died, and all 41 terrorists too. Most of them died from the gas. For Vitaly Dimitkin, it is the worst mission of his career as an elite soldier. I have served in the Alpha Special Unit for 25 years and grown accustomed to the sight of death. When everything was over, at dawn, I first thanked God that I was still alive. Then I called my mother. I told her, I'm alive. On December the 20th, 2011, the European Court of Human Rights partially agrees with the relatives' complaints. They claim that the risky operation caused the high number of victims. There is no winner in a hostage situation. The victims usually continue to suffer from the experience for many years afterwards. Special police units have learned from the past and have developed new strategies for dealing with hostage takers. Then, as now, the protection and rescue of the victims is the highest priority. At first glance, they lead entirely normal lives. But in reality, they are women killers, men who murder women. In the United States, Ted Bundy, a charming single man who buries his victims in the woods. I'll plead not guilty right now. In South Africa, Moses Sitola. He promises women jobs and success and kills them. This whole area here was scattered with bodies. And in Canada, Robert Picton. At his farm, he throws wild parties with a deadly climax. They found thousands and thousands of DNA, human DNA. And there are still more women killers. Their deeds are among the greatest crimes of all time. in the northwestern United States, a beloved vacation destination for families from nearby Seattle. But in the summer of 1982, the idyllic river transforms into a grave. While on a bicycle ride, two children find a strangled girl under the bridge. She is just 16 years old. Sue Peters is one of the lead detectives on the Green River case. She realizes rather quickly that all this is just the beginning of something bigger. As my partner and I were walking along the shoreline, heading down towards the river along this bank, we discovered another female's body deep in the brush. Again, a 16-year-old girl. She's been missing for three days. And then Detective Peters finds even more female corpses. Finding three bodies in one day made us realize that we had a very serious problem and probably a serial killer on our hands in our local area. The bodies. All are of runaways or prostitutes. No one suspects that a seemingly harmless family man is behind the murders. His name, Gary Ridgway and he has a signature all his own. The murders of a serial killer will often get special components to them that are unique to that case. In his victims, Ridgway put rocks into their vaginas, presumably in a way to sort of keep someone else out for his later desires, his later attempts, his later commissions of necrophilia. 
Sue Peters still suspects none of this. First, search parties comb the entire river basin. They discover the blouse of one of the victims and sperm residue, which they freeze. Today, helpful pieces of evidence, but in the mid-1980s, the police have no chance of catching the culprit this way. The police in those early times didn't have a technique for linking individuals so certainly. Remember, going back to that time frame, our ability of actually collecting and analyzing trace amounts of evidence was, um, you know, didn't really exist. A half year and seven female corpses later, the inhabitants in and around Seattle are frightened. Who will be the next victim? For the time being, there's only one thing Sue Peters and her colleagues can do. Keep a broad area along the river's course under surveillance. But the killer reacts and chooses a new scene for his crimes. The detectives find the next body 20 kilometers away from the river. The new strategy was that he drove out to the outskirts of King County and dumped the bodies of the victims in the forested area like this. The murderer is careful in choosing the locations where he leaves the bodies. The corpses are supposed to remain undiscovered for several days. Only this way can he indulge his sick impulses. He would revisit crime scenes just to go back and have sex with his victims again. It could have been for different reasons. On the one hand, it could have been because he doesn't want to yet go out and find a new victim, so it's a second choice substitute to relive the event. Or he could have had some general sexual preference for engaging with sexual behavior with, with deceased people. The killer is willing to drive further and further. The chance of catching him in the act fades. Just about all the victims were prostitutes. So Detective Sue Peters and her team search for suspects along Pacific Highway South, Seattle's street walking scene in the 80s. They are very easy to be targeted because of that lifestyle that they're involved in. They were available on the highway that he went up and down in his truck. He would see them there, he knew they were there, and once they were off the street, he knew that he had them secure. The number of victims continues to rise. Pressure on the detectives mounts. But Ridgway's cover is good. So often, like many serial killers, the reason that they're successful is that they blend into society, much like Gary Ridgway did. He was a man who was a church-going, family man who had some difficulties in his private life, but held down a job and was, to all intents and purposes, quite normal. After a few months, the police work with the street walkers pays off. A pimp reports the prostitute Marley Marva missing. She's 18 years old. She had gotten in a pickup truck and was never seen again. The owner of the truck, Gary Ridgway, for the first time, the Green River Killer comes to the attention of Sue Peters. Mr. Ridgway told the police that he was uninvolved in the incident and did not pick up any girl on the highway. Remember, the officer uh, knew Gary Ridgway from school, so it didn't do much. Shortly thereafter, the police formed the Green River Task Force. They discover a shoe print, size 11, and another remote crime scene. The killer must know the area. A few months later, Ridgway again comes to the attention of police. He offers an undercover policewoman money for sex. There's no evidence that he's also the killer, but the noose is tightening around his neck. Gary Ridgway ended up picking up another girl that he was going to date, and they went to a wooded area. The girl ended up biting his privates, and they got into a scuffle, and she was able to get away. Detectives question Ridgway, but he stays as cool as ice, and even insists on taking a lie detector test. A polygraph test is a test 
for certain physiological reactions. If you don't have any guilt, you're not going to get the increase in your heart rate or your breathing that would be associated with normal guilt. Sue Peter's task force puts Ridgway at the top of their list of suspects, but she can't prove anything. This was Gary Ridgway's house back in the 1980s time period, and he would actually bring women back here that he was dating and ended up murdering them there. Then, two years and about 30 bodies later, the series of murders seems to stop. Sue Peters and her team find a few more dead women, but none who have been killed recently. The police search Ridgway's house in 1987. They even call in the FBI, but the killer leads an inconspicuous life. He was in our radar several times, but there wasn't enough evidence to arrest him. In the following years, detectives find 10 more bodies, but no evidence. Until a brand new method of investigation changes everything, DNA analysis. The analysis of DNA is now an incredibly powerful tool for the police, not just for modern cases, but for cold cases, for cases where there is material still left in unsolved crimes. This gives investigators a new chance. They compare Ridgway's saliva sample with old pieces of evidence, a match. They arrest him in the parking lot where he works. At first, Ridgway seems to admit to the murders. Are you presently under the influence of any drugs, alcohol, or medications? No. How do you plead to the charge of aggravated murder for the death of Alma A. Smith? Guilty. But he only admits to six murders. Ridgeway wants to avoid the death penalty. Only when the police guarantee this does he speak. The killer shows no remorse whatsoever for the women he has killed. When you have so many victims like Ridgeway, I think it's impossible not to argue that there was a level of objectification going on here, where he was seeing the woman, the victims, as objects, as objects specifically for his sexual desire, for his sexual purposes, and nothing else. He might even enjoy the fact that he gets the attention from a trial, because now he's again the center stage. He gets to see the pictures of what he's done. He gets to hear about the suffering of his victims. And that, again, might be a secondary pleasure for him to go through that process also. Investigators accept the deal, and Gary Ridgway admits to more murders. Once he refers to 48 victims, once to 71. I believe most definitely there still are some bodies in the forest. There have been a lot of women that are still missing in King County, and their remains have never been recovered. Ultimately, the court convicts Gary Ridgway for the murder of 49 women. Thanks to his deal, the killer has managed to avoid the death penalty. But the Green River killer will remain behind bars for the rest of his life. For Sue Peters, this sentence is the end of a 20-year chase. It was a relief to me and knowing that Gary Ridgway would never hurt any of the ladies in our community again. For people around Seattle, a new chapter in life begins. A life without fear of Gary Ridgway. But there are more of them, women killers. Generally, they cause widespread fear and panic for years, and their acts are among the worst crimes of all time. My name's Ted Brown. South Africa, Johannesburg. 1995, people are in an uproar. The reason, 40 rapes and 38 murders in only one year. This whole area here, we're scattered with bodies. And it's a place you won't forget to know. The victims, all young women. What some victims would do is allow them to pass out and then stop strangling them. So they would revive by themselves and then continue to strangle them. Their killer, Moses Sitole. How to say that fuck? How do investigators catch the brutal woman killer? Atteridgeville, a township north of Johannesburg. 
The inhabitants are largely black African and poor. In July 1994, Captain Vinol Vinhula is called to a nearby field. What he sees here is truly shocking, even for an experienced investigator. We found a female deceased, uh, dead by manual strangulation. Uh, we also saw that her pants were taken off, uh, thinking that most probably she was raped as well. It saddens one. A person, when you find a body, uh, not knowing why that person was killed. The young woman is the first victim of the 30-year-old killer, Moses Sitole. And he's just begun. From now on, investigators find a new victim every month. All of them female, black African, and between 19 and 30 years of age. Strangulation is, is seen to be the most common method, at least in South Africa. It's a very personal and very up close way of killing the victims. The overarching goal for most of these guys is the issue of controlling and, and uh, power for them. Controlling their victims, controlling their lives, controlling their destinies. And I think that was the case with Satole. Because what some victims he would do is allow them to pass out and then stop strangling them. So they would revive by themselves and then continue to strangle them. Each woman dies according to the exact same pattern. That indicated to us that a serial killer was busy in this area and we had to get hold of him and apprehend him as quick as possible before more victims was part of his crime. Investigators have an initial profile they know that the killer strangles the women, and his victims are poor. They search for more evidence in the victim's milieu, but no one has noticed anything. For the police investigation, it must be very frustrating to know there is a killer, to have so much information, but not to be able to identify the one person. And a fresh victim, sad as it may be, can often give you that little piece of information that's going to lead you to actually solving the case. But the police do not want it to come to that. The mid-1990s are a boom period in South Africa. Many unemployed women move from the town into the city in order to earn money. From family members, Captain Vin Hula knows that the women always go missing during the day, mostly in busy places. Investigators suspect that the killer offers the women a job, thus luring them into his trap. He was very charming. He was a very good smooth talker, um, very believable, quite a good looking guy. So most people that he approached didn't sense him as a threat. The women never come back. They believed in him because of their innocence. And that's the reason why they followed him. And they got killed. It's terrible. It's, it's gruesome. It's not the way that anybody wants to die. A little later, more murdered women in nearby Cleveland. First, it was one body every month. Now, the killer strikes more often. First, every two weeks, then every week, and soon, two times a week. All serial killers fantasize about the perfect murder, the murder that fulfills all of their fantasies. But if you don't achieve your perfect murder, then there's a desire to do it again. By July 1995, one year after the first murder, Moses Sitola has strangled 18 young women to death. The police decide to go public with this story, and indeed, shortly thereafter comes the crucial call. After the murders in Alteridgeville and Cleveland, a civilian reports several bodies in Boxburg. Sitol gets the name, the ABC killer. In September 1995, 
Captain Van Hula arrives at the worst crime scene of the investigation so far, only 20 kilometers away from Johannesburg. This whole area here was scattered with bodies. And it's a place you won't forget in your life. It lets you feel like crying for somebody that lost their, 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 their lives and then believing in other people, in a person, for giving a job, uh, or promising a job to assist to get a job and then end up dead. Vin Hula finds the bodies of 14 women all strangled. So it is very, very difficult. A lot of pressure was on. And Nelson Mandela himself came to one of the townships to ask the people in the township to help the police to solve the crime. The black African community stages increasingly frequent protests and demands that the murders get finally solved. Captain Vin Hula wants justice for the people. And indeed, he finds a crucial piece of evidence when researching one of the victims. Trifina is a social worker in the Kids Haven Youth Centre and mentions a job offer the day before. A friend of one of the deceased ladies uh, were found here. We interviewed the lady and she provided us with the name of Moses Itole. Uh, we managed to get a photo of him and through his records we, to identify him. The photo of Moses Sitoli appears in the press nationwide. The police search intensively and try to find out more about the alleged killer. Moses Sitoli grew up the fourth child in a poor family. As a young boy, he is abused by his mother and his stepsister. Traumatizing experiences which the woman killer never forgets, as he himself later says. And I thought to myself, fuck, does this woman know what she's doing in my heart? Or how do you know She's making me crazy. When his father dies, Moses Sitole is sent to a juvenile home. Twice he runs away and goes back to his own house. But no one wants him there anymore. When a man is head, it's true head. They can do anything. For Moses Sitoli, he had a very uh, difficult childhood. He had a very domineering mother. He felt that woman from, literally from birth, had rejected him, punished him. He, had, he says there was a false allegation and conviction for rape. And it was then that he decided I'm going to go out and rape and murder woman. The young man must make it on his own in a time in which violence reigns on the streets. Sitole quickly notices that many women find him attractive. When I talk to you, she must think I'm quiet. I'm OK, I'm handsome. But, but inside, as I say, I was a baby. Myself, I'll show him. Summer 1995. After over a year of killing, Sitole gets overconfident. He calls a newspaper and brags about the murders. I think clearly for Moses Sitole that the issue of being known for these crimes, it increases his self-worth in his own eyes. But the killer makes a crucial mistake. He gives away information about his location during the telephone call. Some of my black members were placed at a factory to have obs observation for him. Uh, we as whites were further away because if he see us as whites, he would have been suspicious. He did pitch. Uh, my members did approach him. When he saw them, he started running away. They followed him. Uh, he turned around, took out a machete and started. Uh, axing to them, uh, then he got shot in the stomach, uh, arrested, and then transported to hospital. It was the best day of our lives. Uh, satisfactory, we know we have him. Uh, no more murders can take place anymore. He was inside. Sitoli is finally in custody. 
He is indicted five days after his arrest. The trial lasts one year. Little by little, peace is restored to the population. Even though no one knows how many women the killer truly has on his conscience. I would say the total lot is counted at the present moment of 38. You understand? It's not the right total. It's a good lesson for ladies around this country in Africa. And take note and be serious with life. So you should have taught them a good lesson? Yeah, it is. Very good. On October the 21st, 1996, the court finds Moses Sitole guilty of 38 murders and 40 rapes, sentencing him to 2,410 years in prison. For Captain Vinhula, it is the end of a chase that lasted much too long, but was ultimately successful and gives the relatives at least some satisfaction. But there are also women killers who are active over a period of many years. Their deeds are among the worst crimes of all time. I'm staying with the man I know best right now, and that's me. Vancouver. A man kills dozens of women over six years. It's the largest criminal investigation in Canada's history. Robert Picton the butcher of Canada. The farm becomes a horror show. They found thousands and thousands of DNA, human DNA. Detective Lorimer Shenher devotes his entire career to hunting the killer. My first concern was, you know, did we have, was he digging, you know, underground bunkers? Was he keeping women alive down there? A case that rocks Canada to the core and even today has not lost its grip. How could it all happen? Vancouver, 1998. Detective Laurie Machenhe has only recently begun working in the homicide division. His assignment is to find women who have been reported missing. So it was my second day on the job um, investigating Vancouver's missing women, and I got a tip, which was a call to Crime Stoppers, and it said that a man named Robert Picton, who lived on a farm, could be responsible for the missing women. So right away I was excited, and I thought, this, this is the kind of tip that I'm looking for. The name Robert Picton, a first lead. But there are hundreds of Pictons around Vancouver. So Detective Laurie Machenho tries to find out more about the victims. I wanted to find out, first of all, how many women we were actually dealing with and were, we, were there women missing that we weren't aware of. And I also made contact with all of the, um, the family members on, on each file who, were, who had reported them missing. What Shenher discovers is striking. 17 of the missing women come from the city's red light district and drug neighborhood, the first lead. While Detective Shenhe searches for clues, more and more women fall into the hands of Robert Picton. The farmer regularly engages prostitutes. His tastes are extreme, and he knows that prostitutes are easy prey. They weren't really concerned with this group of the population. They may have noticed it, but it was another prostitute. She probably wasn't murdered. She's just moved on to some other place. But Detective Laurie Machin here believes that there is more behind the disappearances. You know, it was really difficult to get people to believe that something sinister might have happened to them. I suspected strongly it was a serial killer for the for the Number one reason, we weren't finding any bodies. We were not finding bodies. The detective tries to prove that a woman killer is at work. But even Detective Shenhe doesn't really know what Picton does exactly. 
On a regular basis, the farmer takes the prostitutes home with him. He throws wild parties at his pig farm that go to dawn. Hardly any of the girls leave the place alive. Meanwhile, Detective Laurie Machenhair searches for evidence to support his theory. He wants to locate the anonymous caller. And he's successful. Shen Hair manages to trace the number. After weeks of convincing, the man, who calls himself Bill Hiscox, agrees to meet at a Starbucks. We took him to a Starbucks, uh, went in, I went in and got a coffee, and we sat in the car uh, and talked. He didn't want to be seen with the police. And he told that he had a friend who'd seen uh, bloody clothing in bags in the Picton trailer and women's ID, uh, and that this woman thought that this, uh, this stuff belonged to potentially some of the missing women from Vancouver. The informant is scared and disappears again right away. But his information leads Shen Hare to a pig farm in Port Coquitlam. It belongs to the biggest and richest farmer in the region, Robert Picton, a man with powerful friends. I drove around the property on the outside to have a look around, and uh, it was really obvious to me that that it was not a very welcoming place. And, you know, when I half expected some guy to come out with a with a shotgun and rack the shotgun at me or something. Uh, it was really inhospitable. Shen He quickly discovers that Picton's home is more than your average farm. Once a week, the farmer throws very special parties, so-called Piggy Palace Good Times parties. He was able to buy friendship with drugs and with alcohol. And all of the, these things combined together to make him feel a much better person. At Picton's farm, government officials party together with Hell's Angels and prostitutes. There were two types of parties. There were the sort of above board community parties where you would see local politicians, police officers, other people in government. Uh, but there were also sex parties and uh, a lot of drugs, a lot of alcohol and um, you know, it's, uh, I think a lot of times the things that happened at those parties weren't necessarily things that, uh, that everybody was consenting to. Shen Hare is certain. The powerful party guests are the reason that no one is talking. Even his requests for a search warrant are rejected again and again. Trying to find somebody who was willing to talk and go on the record. You know, there were even people who worked for the RCMP who knew various people who were coming to these parties, but they didn't want to talk about it. The detective tries to find out more about the mysterious farmer, who seems to be protected from on high. Robert Picton is the kind of person who you would describe as a social outcast. He was uh, made fun of at school, and he lived on a farm with, with pigs, and his best friends were alleged to be the animals. The farm has been in the Picton family for generations. As a child, Robert Picton already slaughtered and butchered pigs regularly. His one real skill, the thing that he actually excelled in, was butchering animals. Early on, the future killer learns from his mother. Human beings are only animals. His mother was a, a very dominant, tyrannical lady who clearly was the prime force in his childhood. When Picton's mother dies, the Butcher of Canada gives free rein to his impulses. The satisfaction and the sense of control that he was missing, he was getting this from his interaction with prostitutes and his, his killing of prostitutes. It was really a win-win situation. One, he gets these victims. He gets to enjoy them, kill them, rape them, engage with them, and then when he's done, he doesn't have to worry about, okay, now what do I do with the body? I have to transport it someplace and dump it. Right here, he had a ready-made way to get rid of the victims. Picton feeds the bodies to his pigs. A story so incredible that no one is willing to believe it. 
Meanwhile, 30 women from around Vancouver have gone missing. Detective Shen here despairs, has nightmares, can't let go. Then the case is taken away from him. When my superiors made the decision to pass the file on, um, I really felt two different ways. I felt, on the one hand, um, I felt like a failure. Because I was so burnt out and I'd been wearing so many hats, I felt there was a possibility I'd made mistakes and that I'd missed things. And I felt maybe somebody who came in with fresh eyes would, might see something that I didn't see. But little happens. For a whole year, women continue to go missing until a civilian reports something suspicious and encounters a policeman who knows nothing at all about Picton's connections. A guy driving a truck had been out to his farm, had seen many weapons at the farm and mentioned this to the police. And the police then decided that they would go and have a look and see what was going on at the farm. When they finally do focus on him, the, the farm becomes a horror show. Police find not only non-registered weapons, but also an asthma inhaler bearing the name of one of the missing women. The decisive turn. For an entire year, officials search the property, dig the whole thing up. You know, in this dirty, sloppy, messy, stinky pig farm, you're now trying to find literally a hundred plus victims within that. Very, very difficult task. They found thousands and thousands of DNA, human DNA. For Laurie Machen here, this is ultimately a kind of success. But mostly, it is just a punch in the gut. If we could have searched this area when we first got the Lynn Ellingson tip, uh, there's no question in my mind we would have saved between 13 and 17 women. Even today, it's not entirely clear how many women Robert Picton lured to his farm and killed. He himself said that his goal was the big 5-0, 50 murders. The sentence comes five years later. Life in prison for only six proven murders. For Detective Shen here, a frustrating sentence that has come far too late. What small bit of vindication I felt, uh, you know, was in, in being right, because I was right and I knew all along that it was him, um, it was completely overshadowed by, by that sense of devastation. And, uh, you know, it's hard to explain a feel, what it feels like to, to say I was in shock for something that I expected every day was going to happen. Picton is finally behind bars. But after this case, Detective Shen here loses his faith in justice, and he quits. In the United States, arguably the worst woman killer of all commits his monstrous deeds, Ted Bundy. I'll plead not guilty right now. For a long time, even one of America's top investigators cannot stop him. Well, I believe he didn't have a conscience about what he was doing. A charming killer who slays his victims and buries them in the woods. Bundy's smile means death for more than 30 women. Robert, my name is Ted Bundy. How do investigators manage to catch this woman killer? Summer 1974. At Sammamish Lake, near Seattle, people are enjoying the weekend. One of them, an attractive, friendly man with his arm in a sling, Ted Bundy. A classic psychopath is someone who is quite intelligent, who is charming, who has easy access to victims. Luring the unsuspecting victim is just as much about power and control as is your physical domination while you're busy assaulting and killing that person. Ted Bundy asks young women for help with his boat and lures them to the river bank. And he beats the girls to death. Detective Robert Keppel is one of the most famous investigators in the US. The hunt for Ted Bundy marks his life to this day. He appeared to be the good looking guy that everybody's girlfriend would want to date. And some of the women that he chose were just outstanding women. 
Bundy strikes twice on this day. First, he carries off 23-year-old Janice Ann Ott, and then he flirts with 19-year-old Denise Marie Naslund. And then, boom, he would change that personality like a chameleon. He would be the very nice, accommodating, friendly, good-looking guy, and then all of a sudden he would turn into this monster. For Bundy, it's about more than just killing. Was a man who liked to have sex with dead bodies. So he was always talking about that when I met with him. The three times that I've interviewed him, he was very comfortable in talking about necrophilia. It could be a way that he doesn't have to go out and get a new victim yet. He still prolongs the pleasure from that particular victim, although in a very gruesome manner. These are all indicative of a person who does not feel at all for what this person, or what used to be a person, uh, might, have, might have gone through. The families are desperate and report both girls missing. Two months later, a hunter finds human bones in the mountains, only a few kilometers away from Sammamish Lake. Robert Keppel's hunt for Ted Bundy begins here. We were there for approximately a week collecting bones that we found throughout the hillside. Well, we expanded our team from two of us to seven. We had one skull that we found where there were skull fractures. So we knew what happened to that lady. Keppel immediately thinks of the missing girls Ott and Naslund, but the bones alone don't bring him any further. This was in the 70s. We, we weren't really engaged in that kind of forensic analysis. There wasn't any type of DNA analysis. We weren't even aware of DNA analysis. After days of searching, a first success. Keppel's team finds tufts of hair. The one with the head damage had black hair, and there was blonde hair there along an animal trail. And what we did was get samples of their hair from their room, from their hairbrushes, from their bathrooms, and the blonde hair belonged to Janice Ott. Who is the killer? The clue leads Detective Keppel to Seattle University. Female students have been disappearing here recently. Almost all of them long-haired and attractive. A lot of the victims that he selected later on matched basically physically the description of this girlfriend that dumped him. He was trying to live out this interaction between him and his ex-girlfriend, but in a way where he was in charge. He decided when it ended, and he decided the ultimate outcome. Initially, the investigation comes to nothing. Then Robert Keppel and his team find the remains of 18-year-old Susan Rancourt. Friends of the university tell of a young man on campus with his arm in a sling who approaches women. Panic quickly grips college campuses. Security staff guard the students. And then, the nightmare appears to be over. No more mysterious man with his arm in a sling. No more missing women. Seattle seems safe again. But Ted Bundy doesn't stop. He chooses a new hunting ground. Soon there are murders in the states of Oregon, Idaho, Utah, and Colorado. He moved state, he moved to a place where he was unknown and began again in the same manner. Really his victim selection type should have been something that jurisdictions keyed in on. But agencies in Washington didn't know what agencies in Utah were doing. 24 murders later, Bundy finally gets tripped up in a vehicle inspection. The policeman knows his description and arrests him. 
Ted Bundy, you know, he, would, he studied at university for a period. He was very good looking, very well spoken. People just didn't expect that this could be the guy committing these very brutal acts. And the evidence is thin. No clues, either at the university or in his former student residence. Nevertheless, the court indicts Bundy for murder. He decides to represent himself. He was not a lawyer. He had not graduated from university in law school at all. He took law classes, that's all. Bundy flees before the verdict is rendered. He's then quickly caught and breaks out again. For Detective Robert Keppel, it's a bitter setback. I was just amazed that they would allow him to escape twice. First time was one thing, but the second time, no excuse for it. But that was Colorado authorities. They weren't that smart. The woman killer makes it to Florida. There he kills the students Lisa Levy and Margaret Bowman and attacks five girls with a wooden bludgeon. He needed to kill someone, but he didn't have the time to plan his route. And so it had to be a blitz attack to achieve what he wanted. In Seattle, Robert Keppel reads in the newspaper about the murders in Florida. And he's sure it must be Bundy. I did call him and reminded them of who he was. But the problem was they didn't care. Thanks for the information and hung up the phone. Two weeks later, Bundy kills a child for the first time. A 12-year-old girl, I think for him, was, was at a point when his world essentially was falling apart. He wasn't the Ted Bundy, the offending Ted Bundy from earlier in his career. Bundy gets sloppy. Again, he's stopped by police and is arrested. Represent yourself, or you're going to get another attorney. I'm staying with the man I know best right now, and that's me. But there's still no solid evidence. The case is entirely circumstantial. The killer is self assured. Mr. Bundy? He told me that you told him that you were going to get me. He said he was going to get me. Okay, you've got the indictment. It's all you're going to get. Let's read it. Let's go. Theodore Robert Bundy, you are charged, indictment, two counts burglary in the, uh, two counts murder in the first degree, three counts attempted murder in the first degree. I'll plead not guilty right now. The law student believes he can overwhelm the court and the jury with his charm. Robert, my name's Ted Bundy. To commit a crime and then to believe that you're the best person, you're the most qualified person to defend yourself, that's a level of arrogance that goes far beyond what most people would be willing to accept. But for a psychopathic narcissist, of course you are your first choice. It's Bundy's final decision. The court sentences him to death by electric chair. Before his execution, Bundy tries to stall by promising to confess more murders. Detective Robert Keppel sets off immediately for Florida. Well, he wasn't in very good shape. He was sweating. He was out of breath. He had a lot of worry in his mind. He did not want to talk about anything other than what he wanted to talk about. He was always playing a game. He was always fishing and wanting to get some advantage. And the decision was that this was Ted Bundy playing games. And so they said, no, thank you. You're to be executed. Ultimately, Bundy confesses to 30 murders. Investigators believe it was twice as many. After nine years on death row, the sentence is finally carried out. The terror that Bundy spread is definitely over. And women are once again safe from the man who was arguably 
the USA's worst killer. Women killers. They've all murdered dozens of women brutally and paid for it. Three of them are now spending life behind bars. And Ted Bundy is finally history. They rule the underworld and their power seems endless. Gang bosses. In Colombia, Pablo Escobar. His illegal drug dealings terrorize an entire country. I'm sure that he believed that he was somehow semi-divine. In Canada, Maurice Boucher, the boss of the Hells Angels, wages a brutal gang war. Car bombs, jail fights, a drug trade worth millions. They're all part of a vicious war. And in Italy, Salvatore Rina, the head of Cosa Nostra, kills everyone who gets in his way. Rina makes the Mafia a terrorist organization. How do investigators get them behind bars? The most powerful gang bosses of all time. In the 1980s, the Mafia controls large parts of the city. And he wants to rise to the very top, John Gotti, a thug from the Bronx. His speciality, robberies and drug trafficking. The FBI uses all its power to crush the Mafia. One of the lead investigators, Special Agent George Gabriel, well, the only way you're going to put the Mafia in jail is you've got to catch them committing their crime. And a big part of their crime, especially when you're the boss of the family, is conversations. It's meeting with people, giving orders. Um, and in order to do that, you either have to get their conversations or you have to put them together. And the meetings are very important to cover. What FBI agent Gabriel does not suspect at the time in December 1985, an assassination will upset the balance of power in the New York underworld. The victim, Paul Castellano, head of the Gambino family and mafia boss number one, shot on the street in plain sight. The way he was killed, there was no doubt in anyone's mind who did it. We knew John Gotti was responsible. We also knew that was a big challenge how we were gonna be able to prove that those guys did it. So it's frustrating when you know who did it and you can't prove that they did it. Witness testimony provides only vague information about 11 alleged culprits wearing Russian hats. Otherwise, nothing. Why did Gotti kill his own boss? His own boss had become distant from the family, had become greedy and so was asking for a lot of money uh, from the members of the family and wasn't sharing as much. And, um, and so there was a lot of uneasiness. Castellano's mistake was that he didn't understand the extent of Gotti's ambition. After the attack in front of Sparks Steakhouse, John Gotti takes power in New York and completely shakes up the Mafia's organization. His goal, to make as much money as possible in the waste management and the construction industry with drug trafficking and racketeering. FBI agents are presented with a challenge to find out who works for Gotti and how his newly structured mafia functions. The mafia is well connected and knows exactly who works for the FBI. And that is what the agents are using to their advantage. We wanted to get in their face 
but also we could put pressure on. Because if we went and talked to a wise guy at any time, they're supposed to go back and report that to their boss. We'd wait till we saw them on the street and then pull over, get out of the car, go talk to them. They hated it. Absolutely drove them crazy. The FBI keeps Gotti under surveillance, but he doesn't let it get to him. He presents himself as a man of the people and celebrates himself as New York's open-handed, good-looking Robin Hood. So one of the key features of, of John Gotti is that he cared very much about his, uh, his appearance. And so he used to go to the barber every day. He was dressed in a very fashionable way. Got his nickname, the Dapper Don. Tailored suits, expensive cars. Gotti makes about 15 millions a year. At the same time, the mafia boss mocks the FBI. He bribes juries and hands out death sentences at will. So one of the problems when you bring people like John to trial is they do everything they can to compromise the trial. They try to buy the jurors. They try to intimidate their witnesses. He was very good at being at being acquitted at, at trials. He threatened witnesses, he threatened judges, he threatened prosecutors. Time and again, the FBI tries to take Gotti down. But witnesses all suffer from sudden memory loss. He thought he was untouchable, and so he continued to commit uh, serious crimes, thinking he would never be arrested. In five years, Gotti stands trial three times for drug trafficking and murder. Each time he goes free. Then the presumed big chance. The state of New York itself indicts the gang boss for murdering a union official. But once again, the evidence is spotty. When John got acquitted on that case, when the jury came back not guilty, the pressure really mounted because now John went from the Dapper Don to the Teflon Don. John Gotti gets overconfident. His new mafia headquarters in the middle of downtown New York City, in plain sight of the FBI. I think it was probably a complacency, which is something that comes with power. People believe that they're untouchable, they're unassailable, and Gotti certainly had such an elevated sense of himself. Agent George Gabriel smells his chance. Using a special NASA camera, his team films the Ravenite social club day and night. It's a popular venue for mafiosi, and in the first floor, Gotti's headquarters. For all underworld bosses have to visit the Mafia Dom once a week. When we first started surveilling this club, we didn't know who almost half the people were, because we'd never seen them before. He brought them right into view, so we could take beautiful pictures of them, beautiful video of them, identify them. But what, so what he did was he identified who and what the Gambino family was. And that's something that could take years to do. He did it for us in months. A great boon for investigators. But knowing who works for Gotti is not enough. They have to know what happens behind closed doors at number 247. They use highly sensible directional microphones hidden in the bumper and wheel cases of a car. What the FBI need is proof that he is associated with criminal conspiracies that are carrying out crimes that they have been able to identify. After three months, the breakthrough. The FBI manages to get into the club unnoticed and uses its chance. From now on, they won't miss a single word. Because we knew this is where John was conducting his more serious business, we put a bug in the club, which was on the first floor. Then we found out he was using the hallway. So that back door, down that hallway, he'd come out from behind the club. We put a bug there. We were getting good conversations, but then we found out the secret hiding spot was in one of the apartments two stories up. So we put a bug there. The FBI gathers crucial evidence from the bugs about drug deals, blackmailings, and contract killings. They arrest Gotti. 
And that was the basis of the trial. And that was uh, how the main evidence was collected over several months of, of the um, uh, orders he was giving to the, to the crew. 14 months later, the trial begins. And investigators now have yet another ace up their sleeve. People decided to go to the police and squeal on him. And in Gotti's case, this is very famous because it's a man named Sammy the Bull Gravano. At that point, Sammy the Bull decided to become a, a whistleblower, a witness for the prosecution, and was the key witness that, that confirmed what the police had overheard in his club, and that led to his downfall and his conviction for life. Johnny Gravano, long Gotti's closest ally. Now he is a crucial principal witness. When you walk into a courtroom, it's 50-50. Uh, it's like theater. Both sides put on their little movie, and it's kind of a scary feeling that you still have to recognize, as good as it is, you could still lose. But this time, the Teflon Don was played out. The witness confirms 19 murders ordered by Gotti. The sentence, life in prison. The gang boss is finally under lock and key. For FBI agent George Gabriel, Gotti's conviction is the greatest success of his career so far. It was very rewarding at the end to put John Gotti away, to win a trial and put him away for life. After that, while it was a case of a lifetime, and I knew that, there wasn't going to be anybody to chase like John Gotti again. It was going to be boring, and it was. Gotti dies in prison of throat cancer at the age of 61, and thus is finally history. But there are more of these gang bosses. He and his group massacred over a thousand people in the space of two or three years. Drugs, blackmail, murder. Gang bosses are addicted to power. Their deeds are among the worst crimes of all time. Canada in the 1990s, a war between biker gangs is raging in Montreal. It's over money and narcotics, a multi-million dollar business. Hell's Angels boss, Maurice Boucher, uses every means available. He wanted his gang, the Hell's Angels, to become the only people involved in selling drugs in the area. Investigator André Bouchard hunts down the gang boss. Mom Boucher was a ruthless killer. A protracted battle begins that will cost many lives. Maurice Boucher's rise begins in 1987. At this time, the Hell's Angels control 75% of the drug trade. A war looms between two motorcycle clubs in Montreal. Car bombs, jail fights, a drug trade worth millions. They're all part of a vicious war being fought in and around Montreal between biker gangs. A war over dominance in the cocaine and heroin business. Hell's Angels boss Boucher also wants to bring the red light district under his control. To do so, he must eliminate the competition, the rock machine biker gang. André Bouchard's job? Stop the murderous rocker war of Quebec and protect the populace from Maurice Mom Boucher. He was a greedy person. He had no morals at all. And uh, in, instead of accepting to share, he wanted everything. Mumbushi at the end was making $6 million a month, but he didn't want to share. He was too greedy, and that's what started the war. Violence in Montreal escalates. In 1994, Boucher issues an ultimatum for the drug dealers. They either work for him or for nobody else. The result, biker gangs duel in the streets. Time and again, bombings terrify the city. Dozens of people in and around Montreal die during the biker war. People fear for their lives. The moment you want to become the only one in that market, 
I think you, you go one step further, one step above ordinary criminal, and you become what I would call a mafia, a mafia boss. Then Maurice Boucher crosses the line. The Hells Angels set off another car bomb in front of a rock machine hangout. One of the victims is an 11-year-old child, Daniel de Rocher. They saw the children playing across the street. The guy who pushed the bomb, he knew that that Jeep would blow up and that the kids were in danger, and yet he still pushed the bomb. So to me, that, uh, that's a heartless act and uh, an act of a coward even. And it shows to us that uh, the Hells Angels didn't care. And it was time to take them up. The killing of an 11-year-old boy, a middle-class kid, brings public opprobrium with it and pressure on the police and politicians to do something about it. And that killing was the turning point. Immediately, Montreal forms a 100-man special task force, the so-called Wolverines. But Boucher strikes back. He kills Diane Lavigne, the correctional officer, a randomly chosen victim. They are not psychopaths, at least in my opinion. They are certainly not sensitive to the damage they, they inflict on the people, but what they do is part of their strategy to pursue their empire building. Boucher's goal with the murders is to frighten the police and undermine their authority. But there is no solid evidence that the gang boss is behind it. Nobody knew at that time uh, what had happened because she was a, a mother of two children, uh, not a guard who was known to be a, an aggressive guard at all. Uh, there was no reason for it, you know, and uh, everybody was looking for a reason and they investigated and interrogated and everybody checked, but uh, no, no reason was found at the beginning. A short time later, Hell's Angels boss Boucher has another correctional officer killed. The assassins shoot Pierre Rondeau, a prison bus driver. Meanwhile, investigators are certain the boss of the Hell's Angels is behind everything. They decide to take action. Now it was a confirmation. Now they came at us. Now it was sure that they were trying to get the system, the justice system, they were trying to uh, frighten them. We were 100% sure it was the Hells Angels. That for us was a turning point because that gave us uh, the goal to hit and hit and hit and hit. And we had to bring the war to them. And as of September, we brought the war to them. Whether Rock Machine or Hells Angels, the task force seizes weapons and arrests more and more gang members. Boucher can no longer protect his people. People with whom he had worked had decided that they had been betrayed and went to the police. One of them, Stéphane Gagne, one of Boucher's closest confidants. He confirms that the gang boss is behind the murders. Investigators strike immediately and arrest the leader of the Hells Angels. Maurice Boucher is indicted for multiple homicide. The public and investigators tensely await his conviction. But then something incredible happens. The court acquits Boucher for lack of evidence. It's a slap in the face for Bouchard. To see him walk out, uh, you, you can't understand how you feel inside. You know, you feel empty. Uh, one of the the worst days of our life, uh, because all the work that we put in, uh, hundreds and thousands of hours of work to get him, we had him, poof, and it was gone. The acquittal is an unparalleled defeat for police. Boucher, the boss of the Hells Angels, is in fact released. It's never, no one's really understood why he was let off in that original trial. It could be that he was intimidating witnesses or intimidating the jury, who one doesn't know. 
But investigators and the prosecutor appeal the case. And this time, the court appears to be neither biased nor bribed. Boucher is guilty. The sentence, life in prison. My police officer was at the scene uh, when he arrested him, said to mom, look outside, it's the last time you're gonna see the sun. Boucher, a man who makes millions a year with blackmail and drugs behind bars. The biker war is over, leaving behind an estimated death toll of over 160. Mom Boucher was a ruthless killer. He killed children, he killed a woman. He preyed on the most vulnerable people here in Montreal. He is presently in jail. I think he'll stay in jail. I think he'll die in jail. And that's what he deserves. Boucher is still in a high security prison. The fate of this once mighty Hells Angels boss seems forever sealed. Although rumor has it up to this day that Boucher and his former gang members are still right in control. Gang bosses, they commit terror attacks and kill the innocent. Bribery, drugs, contract killings. Their greed knows no limits. He believed that he was somehow semi-divine. Sicily, home to the legendary mafia clan Cosa Nostra. For a good 20 years, one underworld boss rules the Italian island, Salvatore Rina, a ruthless killer. Everyone who gets in his way must reckon with death. He and his group massacred over a thousand people in the space of two or three years. The gang boss wages a war against all of Italy. The Mafia was always brutal and shrewd, but Rina makes it a terrorist organization. How can investigators stop the brutal mafioso? Palermo, Sicily's capital. Since the early 19th century, the idyllic Mediterranean island has been home to the most notorious Mafia clan of all. Its name, Cosa Nostra, in English, Our Thing. Its most brutal leader ever, Salvatore Rina. The press also calls him La Belva, the Beast. Pier Giorgio Morosini devotes just about his entire career to fighting the gang boss. He's one of Italy's most famous mafia hunters. Without the Mafia, I probably wouldn't be here today. It's a criminal organization. It always stands opposed to justice and is terribly brutal. I simply can't accept that. Fighting the Mafia was always unbelievably important for our country. It is a defense of democracy. The history between Morosini, the mafia hunter, and Rina, the gang boss, has been tightly interwoven for decades. It all begins in 1930. Salvatore Rina is born the son of humble farmers in the Sicilian town of Corleone. At the age of 12, he unexpectedly loses his father to a World War II bomb. Rina must feed his family and finds a new role model, the Mafia boss, Stefano Ligio Bontate. The organization and the capo, the big boss, uh, becomes a substitute, a substitute father and mentor for the, for the young man. And so Rina would do anything for, for Ligio and very quickly made his way up the hierarchy. To become a member of the Mafia, Rina must first earn the organization's trust. The rules are strict. Rina must commit a murder. 
such an important job, such as murdering somebody, is a way to, to give your credentials to the family that you can be trusted in the future. At the age of 19, Rina kills for the first time in the name of the Mafia and goes to prison for it. With this killing, the future gang boss embarks on a path that will soon cost hundreds of people in Sicily their lives. Certainly going to prison is seen as part of the, part of the game. You learn a great deal in prison. You gain respect in the outside world when you're in prison. Rina is released after seven years and continues killing for the Mafia. His goal? To get all the way to the top. In Sicily's capital, Palermo, he kills about 50 people who are standing in the way of Cosa Nostra. And of his own rise to power. Rina pursues a bloody power struggle and comes to the attention of investigators for the first time. Rina came at them unexpectedly because the authorities were actually not policing Sicily. But at first, everyone thinks the gang boss is small fry. That changes in December of 69. Rina gathers allies and storms the house of a rival mafia boss. A war between the clans ensues. Not all the Mafia families accepted this hit. Many opposed it. It was a full-scale assault with Wiener in the lead. The gang boss stages a massacre. The investigation shows the hit squad fires 108 shots at its foes. The upshot was that Ligio, the most important rival boss, handed over power to Totorina. This was the crucial moment. At the time, Pier Giorgio Morosini is part of the anti-mafia unit and wants to take down the gang boss. But Rina infiltrates the police, bribes investigators, and expands his extortion and drug business. The De Sicilian Mafia is a federation of crime families. He wanted to become the boss of all of them. That was his goal, ultimately. For nearly 20 years, Rina wages a war against other Mafia clans. And the Italian state. At first, Morosini's hands are tied. He doesn't know who we can trust and who we can't. And not even one photograph of Rina exists. No one knows who he is. A nightmare for investigators. It was very hard to find Rina in Palermo. He was invisible and had a large network helping him, including the police. Gang boss Rina uses this impotence and becomes more brutal than before. In 1983, he eliminates the leaders of the last big rival Mafia family and definitively takes power in Palermo. Violence didn't really af affect him emotionally. He and his group uh, massacred over a thousand people in the space of two or three years. The few investigators Rina can't bribe try to find out where the gang boss is hiding. But even the people protect and respect Rina. I mean, the mafioso is not just an ordinary criminal. He's not just a robber or a thief or a rapist. He's somebody who has a standing in the community, and the community recognizes authority. And so that's why it's much harder to catch these mafia bosses. 
Morosini's combined efforts to track down the boss of the bosses go up in smoke. The situation was very hard for us. Rina was invisible, but was still committing brutal killings. Achieving our goal required a lot of patience. Investigators develop a plan. Largely unnoticed by the Mafia, they managed to expand the anti-Mafia unit with people they trust. They monitor bank accounts, spy on Rina's confidence, and try to win over the people. It has taken a long time for the police to be trusted so that people could inform on, on Mafia bosses. And then, Rina's cruelty itself provokes the crucial turning point. For years, we fought the Mafia. We remained very patient, surveilled all Rina's contacts, all the people in his circle. And the biggest contribution came from the mafiosi themselves, when the Mafia bosses working for Rina decided to talk to us. After 10 years of extremely brutal violence, even the mafiosi themselves fear the boss of the bosses and spill the beans. Their offer? Mild prison sentences in return for information. The result is the so-called maxi trials. Imagine if you have 500 uh, defendants, imagine each of them has got a, a team of lawyers, imagine how many thousands of people have to be accommodated. The Mafia insiders give everything away about the structure of Rina's organization, his hitmen, and much more. This was a serious blow to him in terms of, of human resources for his organization. Each mafiosi who comes clean brings investigator Morosini and his team closer to the boss of the bosses. The Mafia Kingpin's reaction is surprising. After so many killings, so much bloodshed, there is actually a respite. But it was a calm based on fear. Rina still controlled everything, but he was out of sight, untraceable, in hiding. This was possible because hundreds of people were still protecting him, people who owed him something. Rina secretly plans his revenge. A brutal assassination follows. The gang boss sets off a car bomb. Its goal, to kill Paolo Borsellino, high-ranking judge and sworn enemy of the Mafia. Borsellino and five others die. His decision was to, to kill the prosecutors and the police officers that were investigating the Mafia. And that was just a step too much. But Rina goes even further. A little later, he kills a magistrate, Italy's number one mafia hunter. For Italians, the Carpaccio massacre is like the murder of the Kennedy brothers. It was terrible, like Bobby and John Kennedy, or even like Martin Luther King. In May of 92, an assassin plants 400 kilograms of TNT under the highway. The target, Magistrate Giovanni Falcone. The explosion kills him, his wife, and three bodyguards. Investigator Morosini still mourns the loss of the mafia hunter, one of his best friends. I remember it very well. These images are burnt into the memory of thousands of Italians. There was a huge hole. The earth opened up. It was dramatic. The whole highway destroyed. It looked like pictures after a bombing. 
The assassination rocks all of Italy. The public's mood shifts. They fear the terrorism gripping their home. No one forgives Rina for the murder of Falcone and his wife. They were finally all united in their opposition to Rina and the Mafia organization which was destroying their lives. And this was enough to destroy Rina and all of his people. It was game over for the Sicilian Mafia for the foreseeable future. And eventually, somebody within his own uh, team informed the authorities of where he was. What the anonymous witness reveals sounds unbelievable to investigators. After a good 20 years of bloodshed, they realize Rina has lived the whole time in Palermo, protected by mafiosi and corrupt police. January of 93, investigators arrest Italy's most brutal mafia boss in his hideout. The trial lasts a whole three years. The verdict, 13 life sentences. The fight is over. Rina's arrest was a big win for the state. It avenged the sacrifice of so many Italians. And where Salvatore Rina used to live is now a symbol of Italy, a police station. It is the proof that Italy stood up to Cosa Nostra. And of course, we will continue to fight. Salvatore Rina has been behind bars for about 30 years, waiting to die. The drug lord of Colombia, Pablo Escobar. For power and wealth, he even risks peace in his own country. His crimes made him the mightiest boss of all. For decades, he's always a step ahead of his hunters. We had to wait for Escobar to make his first ever mistake. Burnt out drug huts in the jungle, soldiers in the streets. A war is raging in Colombia. How does Escobar manage to bring an entire country to its knees? Car theft, Kidnapping, even in his youth, Escobar had one goal in particular, to make as much money as possible. It's only with drugs that the amount of profit you make is just skyrocketing. At the age of only 26, Escobar begins smuggling hard drugs on a large scale. His drug farms quickly produce an unbelievable 300 tons of cocaine per year. Colombia is marked by corruption and poverty in this period. Escobar does what all gang bosses do. He bribes everyone who can help him or who could become dangerous. General Octavio Vargas Silva's task, to hunt Escobar and put him and his men under lock and key. In 1989, we started investigating the Medellin cartel. The state court put me personally in charge of and made me responsible for investigating the cartel's criminal activities. Vargas' approach is to catch the little fish first. Above all, dealers and hitmen from whom he hopes to get more information. Investigators arrest cocaine dealers conduct raids, seize millions, without making the crucial breakthrough. The problem, Escobar uses his drug money in part to build hospitals, social housing, and schools. He's considered a kind of good Samaritan, styles himself a pop star of the people. 
He used that reputation to be protected by the community. As soon as anything suspicious from the outside was going on in Medellin, Pablo would know about it straight away. The homeless, poor families, even children work for Escobar. They spy everywhere and warn the gang boss. Vargas and Escobar are often only a few hundred meters apart, but every time, the drug lord manages to give the bloodhounds the slip. Then Escobar has had enough of playing cat and mouse and sets an example. A guerrilla force occupies Colombia's Palace of Justice. The assault was fierce and cruel, an assault on democracy. It's still difficult to talk about. It hurts. The intruders take 300 hostages. Over 100 of them die. The rebels also destroy all the documents. He loved the power. He loved the money. He loved everything that went, that went with it, the control over people. I'm sure that he believed that he was somehow semi-divine. And this is only the beginning. Escobar's next step is to have himself elected to parliament. Escobar's motive for going into politics was primarily immunity, and thus to remain unpunished for his crimes. Vargas does not seize his investigations. With the support of Colombia's justice minister, he manages to destroy numerous drug labs. But Escobar doesn't dither for long. He simply has the justice minister killed. Colombia sinks into chaos. This is not just a police investigation. This is a war. Next, Escobar's assassins kill presidential candidate Luis Carlos Galán, an avowed enemy of the drug mafia. The government responds by setting a bounty, two million US dollars for Escobar's capture, and investigators change their tactics. Now, all it was was an intelligence operation. The intelligentsia. Vargas needs insider information. And indeed, an informant reveals where Escobar is hiding. But the gang boss is clever. There are also numerous children in the house. The police can't risk their death. Mission aborted. Escobar escapes and continues with his war of terror. First, he blows up the Colombian intelligence headquarters in Medellin. Then he blows up the fully booked Avianca flight 203. All those on board die. Escobar overstepped the boundaries, and that's when the state had to react, and it was a full frontal fight. Once again, investigator Vargas must change his tactics. He starts the elite unit search block. It is Colombia's last hope in the fight against Escobar. Search Block's goal was first to discover who belonged to the cartel. Secondly, to disarm them. And thirdly, to arrest their leaders and all others. This actually seems to scare the powerful drug lord. He fears getting caught and extradited to the US. Escobar turns himself in. But the gangster boss has demands. He wants a private prison, built according to his own design. What he saw in that was a recognition from the Colombian state that he is an equal actor and player. In the mountains of the city of Medellin, the gang boss builds his own prison, the so-called cathedral. The prison is like a palace. Luxury kitchen, 
roulette table and a prison bed that Escobar from time to time shares with prostitutes, all included. For Vargas, it is a bitter setback. The gang boss is playing games with the entire country. It was never a prison. It is a disgrace to the murdered and to the victims that Pablo Escobar has on his conscience. Escobar makes exactly the same drug deals as before, just using his own prison as a base. The Colombian government permits it. In a sense, the, the government is not as strong as, as we might think of other governments. So it is better to try to find a way to accommodate or to discuss or to reduce some of his activities uh, as opposed to try to make him pay for the crimes he committed. A good year later, things change. Vargas convinces the government to put Escobar in a real prison. The gang boss flees. His downfall, Escobar has a satellite telephone with him. The police know it and hope to locate him. We knew we were close. The drug lord moves around aimlessly, trying to hide his tracks. But the noose around Escobar's neck continues to tighten. We had to wait for Escobar to make his first ever mistake. And then it happens. Escobar uses the telephone repeatedly. He calls his family again and again. He wants to know if his wife and children are OK. Investigators locate the signal and find the house where the drug lord is hiding. Pablo Escobar was here. The special unit storms the house. A wild firefight breaks out. Escobar tries to escape from the roof. They had very little scruples about whether they got him alive or dead, and they were as happy to see him dead as they were alive. Famously, he said, it's better to die in Colombia than in an American jail, and eventually that's what happened to him. Vargas's special unit shoots Escobar during his attempted escape, his body riddled with bullets. Escobar's death means the end of General Vargas's grueling hunt for the perhaps mightiest drug boss in history. It was all finally over on December 2nd, 1993. Investigators and all of Colombia can finally breathe a sigh of relief. The long-lasting drug war that the gang boss waged against his own country is over. Gang bosses all crave power, money and control. These criminals will stop at absolutely nothing until investigators catch them or they suffer the same fate as their victims.